there will be no real non-controlled currency in the world. For your banks. Increasing the block size to 32 megabytes right now. What would be the top five arguments that would get Sam um, hurled against me? No, that's a good one. There, there are a few that the big blockers uh, uh, got, got right. Ching, like all these coins splash into the wallets of all the winners. I love that. There's a new threat out there. It's crypto. Hello and welcome back to the Bitcoin Cash podcast, following Bitcoin Cash on its rise to global reserve currency. This is episode number 113, Global Government and BCH Resistance featuring Aaron Day. Today is Sunday, the 7th of April, 2024. I'm your host, Jeremy. Jet is doing the producing, same as always. And our guest today is a newly extra passionate BCH adopter, but a longtime Bitcoiner, an entrepreneur, pro-freedom, anti-CBDC advocate, and author of the book, The Final Countdown, which I have a copy of right here. Welcome to the show, Aaron. How'd you get into Bitcoin? Um, I got into Bitcoin in 2011, 2012 timeframe. I actually first heard about Bitcoin on Free Talk Live, which is actually where I understand Roger Ver heard about it as well. So I know Ian Freeman and, and Mark Edge and those guys. Um, I, I live in New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project. So I moved here in 2009. I think I got my first Bitcoin in, in 2012. It was one of the first hundred people or so to use a Bitcoin ATM. And actually used it. I mean, in New Hampshire, we have a whole community that has been accepting cryptocurrency. There are restaurants, shops and everything going all the way back, you know, a, a dozen years now. Um, and then went through the experience that, you know, a lot of us did in 2017, when all of a sudden it started to hit mainstream ado adoption and it stopped working because it, it didn't scale. And so I've been... Uh, uh, moving away from BT, I've moved away from BTC since. Um, and in 2019, I actually exited fiat altogether. So I've been living off of uh, crypto, gold, and silver now for almost five years. <clears throat> yeah. And in, that, and, and in that process, I've actually been using BCH more than than others. So I, I am not a maxi. I, I think if you if you see my page, I I talk about a lot of different cryptos always proof of work, always decentralized, always, you know, coins that have not done an ICO or anything like that. But in terms of actual practical use, Bitcoin Cash has always had the biggest ecosystem, um, you know, using, for instance, BitPay. It, Bit, BitPay actually was the most convenient. I, I hope they get the debit card feature thing resolved. But but that was actually my primary. Bit, BitPay has been my primary go to with BCH for for quite a while. Yeah. So for people who don't know, we've mentioned it a bit about it on the show before, and I've definitely talked to a couple of other people who are uh, from the Free State Project, right? Uh, but it's been a while since that's been kind of discussed and brought up on the show. So do you think you could, especially seeing as you've been there now for, it sounds like quite a long time from very early, can you give us a bit of a rundown for that for people who don't know what, what that's all about? Yeah, the free the free state project. The goal of the free state project is to get twenty thousand people to move to the state of New Hampshire and to basically make New Hampshire the Liberty Beacon for the world. And um, and that's I moved in in two thousand and nine. I actually became the chair of the free state project uh, for for a while. Uh, actually, during the time period where we triggered the move, which is we got 20,000 people to sign a statement of intent indicating that they would move to New Hampshire. So the, the Free State Project holds a couple of big conferences every year, Liberty Forum, which is actually where I first heard Roger and Eric Voorhees and others talk, and then the Porcupine Freedom Festival or Pork Fest, which is a, I believe is now the largest liberty gathering in the world. There were more than 3,000 people there uh, at the last pork fest and so this is a week-long event at the end of june kind of in a beautiful kind of mountain scene on a campground setting um in in, in new hampshire and uh for a long time i mean going back to 2011 2012 there's agora valley where people are, are buying and selling 
all kinds of different merchandise and and crypto gold and silver have have featured as a prominent part of that um, for a long time for over a decade so the movement's going strong there are a lot of people that are involved in local politics that are free staters the uh, majority leader of the state house is a free stater so so the movement actually has has momentum and um you know i'm 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 sticking here. I, to me, this is still the best shot, at least within the United States. Um, although we're not immune to the pressures of the federal government here any more than any other state. Yeah. So, like when you say there's that was the original idea was we get twenty thousand people kind of to commit to it as a target, and then I guess the idea was they would then all follow through on that and they would actually move to New Hampshire. So, what has been the uptake on that, like so far? I don't know what the what the actual stats are, but I know that there are out of 400 people in the state house, I think 100 of, of them or so either identify as free state staters or free state or friendly. So it's a huge I don't, we're not at 20,000. I don't know if it's 5,000. I don't know if it's 10,000, but it's actually a, a pretty a pretty decent percentage. I mean, I know when I was chair, we were you know looking back at this I and mean, some of these people signed this statement of intent you know, years and years ago, and the contact information is, isn't even valid. So trying to reach out to people is, is, has been a challenge. But uh, there are new people moving every week. I mean, we have, there's a, a new movers party. Um, when people move to New Hampshire, uh, people will help unload the moving trucks. There's a whole introductory process. And so I, I, even though I don't know what the numbers are, it's still, and even though we've hit that 20,000 signer number, new people are moving all the time. And actually, COVID, I think, provided a real ramp up for this. I, I've met a lot of people that uh, that ditched other states, a lot of people from California, a lot of people from all over the country uh, during that time period. So I think the actual growth in movers is probably greater now than it was before, um, before we hit the trigger the move target that's, yeah that i mean that's actually really interesting as to how you can probably get some sense for uh the zeitgeist you know if you see a lot of people coming into the free state project it probably is indicative that you know tyranny is ramping up elsewhere right and it's pushing people into this whereas if it slows down it's like actually that might be a good thing it means we're, you know we're winning elsewhere so it's less necessary i just had a look at the stats i new hampshire is the fifth smallest uh, by area and 10th least populous of the 50 US states with a population of 1,377,529 residents as of the 2020 census, according to the ever reliable <laughs> Wikipedia. Uh, but I mean, it's interesting because when you put like 1.3 million people, when you put it in that context, 20,000 maybe doesn't seem like a lot. But as you say, if the community is very tightly knit and it's also very active in politics and also, of course, you know, <clears throat> things change at the margins, right? Because I've seen like Joel Valenzuela, right? Who's another free stater. You, I'm sure you're aware of him. He sure. uh, came on my show and he was talking about how people are getting, you know, salty, right? There's other people who are usually more like Democrat uh, voters who are already upset about the Free State Project and they say <laughs> they're coming in and they're ruining things and, and blah, 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 like because it has been even successful, like to the extent that it has, it's already putting people off. Like you're not doing anything wrong. It's just like I'm just moving to this state and living with the, the values that I believe in. But that kind of direct action has already created, you know, Russell in – people who aren't sympathetic to it, right? Well, that's been going on for over a decade. I ran for school board in 2013, and I, I had people, I had a guy spend $25,000, $30,000 on town, this is a town of 20,000 people, sending out mailers to the entire town, getting the former chief of police, this is somebody I'd never met before, getting all of these people lined up against me, having people, we had 1% of the town actually in a Facebook group trying to figure out how to stop me from getting elected to the school board. And the number one thing that they were using was that I was a free stater. So they would put out all these flyers basically saying what, you know, calling me a colonizer and, and all of this other stuff. So that was a decade ago. And now it's it, now that there are more free staters here, it's gotten worse. Now there are organizations that are funded, uh, I believe, by Soros and others specifically to put out information, identifying and targeting free staters that are involved in political office. So like they're 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 creating lists, they're sharing lists, they're targeting people. So you know you're uh, you're over the target when when there's that level of organization. But but to be clear on the on the on the 20,000 people moving here part. I mean New Hampshire's motto 
is the live free or die state. So even before the free state, it's, it's not like we picked a place that was hostile and that where we were going to come over. If anything, I actually look at the free state project as being an insurance policy for the people that are, that have been in New Hampshire from being invaded by people from Massachusetts and New York and other, other states that want to bring their big government ideology to a place that was already live free or die already focused on principles of limited government. Yeah, I just think it's such a fascinating example because it mirrors, obviously it is sort of somewhat parallel, right, to the the Bitcoin and the Bitcoin Cash and the crypto community as a whole, this kind of direct action, you know, voluntary political change type of movement. So it's really fascinating to see those parallels in the same way that, you know, BCH have to deal with salty BTC laser eyes and how crypto communities as a whole have to deal with no coiners and the government regulators and la da 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 da. Right. It's like the same patterns of human society. It's always the same thing. And anytime you want to do something good, somebody's got to show up to tear it down, right? Yeah, well, I mean, and uh, you know, Ian Freeman was targeted. He was targeted by the FBI by five branches of the of the federal government. And I actually went to his uh, sentencing hearing. I mean, he's he's now in federal prison for eight years for just for the act of selling Bitcoin. And and it was the most manufactured case I think I've ever seen. Like it's it's actually horrendous. And they did it because he's a liberty activist. They did it because he has Free Talk Live. They did it because he has a voice. And they did it because they wanted to create a chilling effect. And so. Um, you know, so from my perspective, the best thing that we can do, you know, to support Ian is to get more people to actually start using peer to peer digital currency for day to day transactions, because, you know, Ian had had set up ATMs throughout the state. Um, he had gotten real merchant adoption. I mean, if you're in Keene, New Hampshire, there are several merchants uh, and restaurants that, that that accept multiple cryptocurrencies. And that's all all because of of Ian's activism. So. So, yeah, no, it's the battleground is here. The battleground is here, not only politically, but even even the the crypto battleground is here. Uh, Jeremy Kaufman is another free stater who who created library. And I believe his company was targeted by the SEC. I mean, there were so many examples of illegal ICOs and, yes. and fundraising. And I, I think library was definitely on the edge. I mean, my use of it, I've only used it as a utility token. I mean, you could argue, you, you, I think the argument was made that it was a utility token, but they went after him because they didn't want censorship resistant speech on the internet. And so, so it is interesting. So I, you know, the funny thing, I, I, I see free staters, I mean, you know, I have, I, I'm married, I have uh, 13 year old twins. And so I, I, I'm not necessarily out and about in the community on a daily basis, because I'm either doing what I'm doing right now, or traveling or spending time with my kids. But but the time that I see free staters the most are, are at these conferences or, or usually at somebody's court hearing. <laughs> and they're, they actually, they're kind of like, it's like a made up in the back of the courthouse or whatever, like, hey, good to see you again. <laughs> like literally that's the case it's like oh well are we going to a state court hearing or are we going to a federal court hearing which everybody knows the buildings you know who's filming it this time i mean we've got a state rep that uh who spent i believe 10 years in federal prison for uh supporting the brown family that didn't pay income tax or whatever and now he's a state rep and um uh you know he's facing charges because he uh filmed inside a federal courthouse i think he did this a couple of times and so it's just it's it's kind of it's you never know what's going to happen at, at, at each new each new court hearing but nowhere else on earth are you going to have that like like this is why it's just it's it's a great it's a great place to be and it really is the the battleground for this stuff yeah so tell me a little bit more about the crypto on the ground sort of adoption there again like i'm most familiar with it i know a couple of other uh free staters that are sort of bch uh fans and like joel he's big on he uses bitcoin cash but he's big on dash so i always wondered if there was more of that adoption there or is there a lot of btc adoption going on do other people who are not interested in crypto when they're at sort of restaurants and stuff do they see that a lot and ask questions about it or how does it kind of go down in person i mean <clears throat> crypto is kind of like the rest of libertarianism everybody has their own flavor of it so like I, there is no I, I wouldn't say there's a concentration of anything but i will say that there are a lot of people that got into bitcoin really early and i know very very few BTC maximalists that are in New Hampshire, even though a lot of us 
got you know involved in this at the very early stages of this i because and, and i think part of that is people have tried to use it people at least in new hampshire at least within the free state project they were attracted to cryptocurrency because of separation of money and state because it what it meant in terms of of the freedom aspects of it and so that's what you're going to find is the now you'll find the debates within that side of the argument as to well should it be monero or should it be you know what i mean it's like you're more than likely to see people debate over whether it should be bch or monero or dash then then you're going to see people full-fledged at this point um, as Bitcoin maximalists. And so these things go through different waves. I mean, Dash, Dash, is, Dash is popular and, and Joel's done a, a great job of, of, uh, of promoting that as, as did Ian, but I mean, it's gone through its cycle as well. So I, I, there, is no, there is no standard, but I think because people got used to using cryptocurrency as cash, you just can't do that with BTC. And you will see all over Twitter, free staters, that talk about Lightning Network from the perspective of, it's it's not like I picked a side because I wanted to pick a side. I keep on trying to use this and it doesn't work and it's embarrassing, or I introduce it to somebody else and it doesn't work. That's like, you know what I mean? People aren't, aren't picking sides just to pick sides. It's just the stuff doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Um, there has been somewhat of a chilling effect, though, because of what happened to Ian. So I know people that operated Bitcoin ATMs out that, that were not Ian that, that have decided to get out of the business now because of the regulatory aspect of this. Even local Bitcoins have 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 shut, has shut down. So it's kind of a um, that's actually part of what prompted me to run for president and write this book was actually to bring awareness to the specific issue, because when I researched, well, hey, why? Why are all my friends either going to jail or having their businesses destroyed? Um, and the, the answer is, is that they're paving way for uh, CBDCs. They don't want permissionless cash that anyone can use. They want programmable cash that they can completely centrally control. And they, they're they much further along in deploying that. So I'm like, I dropped everything in my life to try to actually bring awareness to this. Even within the crypto community, most people are not aware of what's going on with CBDCs. Um, so even within the the free state community. So, I mean, I'll speak at Porkfest and other events and people are, are still not quite aware of how, how far accelerated the dystopian side of this is. And that's the irony, right? I mean, in 2009, you know, we had the financial collapse in 2008 and everybody was starting to realize, hey, this central banking thing is a Ponzi, right? And so people are finally starting to focus attention on it. And I remember the first time that I used Bitcoin, I'm like, this this is awesome. You know, somebody sent me money there was no bank there was no third party it was at that point in time instant relatively instant and the costs were negligible and i'm like wow this is this is amazing and since that time the fiat has has actually done development right we have venmo we have zelle we have google pay we have apple pay we're going to have x payments soon there's there's fed now which is a real time payment system uh, amongst the banks and and in 2017 it's like we decided well we're just not going to innovate anymore at least from the btc side of it we're going to we're going to at the, who when you are experiencing a huge demand for your service who says oh well we're going to make it so that it doesn't work and doesn't scale. And then we're going to try something experimental with some non-specific time period, but it'll work eventually on our own time period when you're actually competing with other things in the world. And so those other things have actually um, warped and leapfrogged the BTC adoption. And now CBDCs as well. There's a US CBDC. People talk about BTC and seven transactions per second. The Project Hamilton retail CBDC pilot can do 1.8 million transactions per second, right? So like we're competing, uh, not just within crypto, we are competing with fiat and we're competing with CBDC and we're not doing well on the competition outside of the, the crypto space, right? There's all this just focus on, well, the market cap, the market is decided because BTC's market cap is, is high. Well, the market has actually decided they want to use fiat and, and CBDCs are going to eat the lunch of crypto if we don't actually do something about this and recognize the urgency of the situation. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm very, very on board with with all of that. And it's certainly it's the whole rising of uh, CBDCs is something that we've highlighted on the show, particularly in the, you know, 2023. We we're really bringing that up as a as a big narrative. And so far, I would say it's been quiet in 2024 on the CBDC 
front, but it's undoubtedly still going on in the in the background. So we will dive into that in a second. But first, we always got to check in on the price. Start of every show, BCH is ranking its way up this week, six hundred and ninety one dollars seventy one US scam cents will buy you 100 megasats of bch so we're way up there one btc sat is falling only buys 100.9 bch sats one ethereum buys 493 megasats i forgot to update these dates but we've had the halving and bliss is soon it's in like 35 days or something like that uh so i'm pretty excited about that bch has solidified its way into position 13 on the market cap at uh 13.6 billion and shiba inu is next up at 16 point nine billion so how much attention do you pay to the markets and how much credibility do you give to the argument of oh, volatility and all that or are you just spending day to day what do you make of the the whole speculation side of crypto well i don't i don't ever trade and and because i live off of crypto it's interesting living off of crypto because when i live off crypto I, I there's no stable coins involved so i wh- one of the things that i've learned just as a separate like lifestyle thing is I got into prolonged fasting and intermittent fasting um, probably in around 2019. And, and, you know, we're really engineered to go through these periods of stress and then recovery as opposed to everybody wants to try to smooth everything out and where you have just like this constant same level of everything all the time. That's we're not even wired for that. But, but when you're living off of crypto and it's not a stable coin, that actually also affects like when the price is down, you're not you, you, the, the point for me is how do I keep my burn rate as low as possible in general? And then if I have to make capital purchases or whatever, I, I do that when the price when the price rises. And so I so from that perspective, I, I very much pay attention to price, but I only actually invest in things that uh, and this isn't necessarily a good investing strategy, by the way, I'll say that up front. I only invest in things that I want to see happen in the world as opposed to what I think is going to win. I, I'm a big believer in you know where you place your attention is where you place your energy. And, and so many people live life hedging. They, the people spend their life putting, you know, half of their energy into something that they don't want to see in the world. And, and, and if everybody does that, this is how we end up with the systems that we have today. So I kind of I tend to go all in on something. So I certainly watch the price. But the thing that's important to me about price, and this is within the realm of the the CBDC context, uh, to me, to be able to compete with CBDCs, we need to have something that that can scale and where there's actual purchasing power. So to me, it's important that the price that go the higher the price, the greater the security of the network, the more purchasing power, the more money there is to invest in the network. So for, in this particular sense, um, price is important, and I and I hope it continues to see the the gains that that it does, and at some point get to the the top of the list because we need it to in order to have an alternative to CBDC. Yeah, absolutely agree on that. And I saw you uh, made a post like I dumped all my BSV into BCH and then the price like started mooning soon after that. So you've been hyping it up a little bit on Twitter. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> well, well, so, so, so I got involved with BSV. So, in, in, you know, if you see in my book, my, my whole purpose on this has been, you know, the traditional financial system can do their arguments over this, but say 50,000 transactions per second. And if just the US CBDC can do 1.8 million transactions per second, then if we're going to provide an alternative, what I don't want to see is a situation where everybody, they'll try to put CBDC through in an emergency. And so if everybody tries to exit all at once, we, we don't want a situation where BCH and everybody else clogs up just like BTC did in 2017, because then, then we're in trouble. So this has been my whole... So I went down the the BSV um, rabbit hole, and and I've spent a lot of time. Um, there are good people in the BSV space, um, and there's some good technology there, and I like the idea behind the big blocks. But but you can't. I, and I watched every day of the trial. I got up at you know five thirty in the morning to watch this this Craig Wright trial, and and. You know, I was like, and I spoke to some people privately because I didn't put it online, but I'm like, this guy, there's no way this guy's Satoshi. Like, I, I don't know if you're, whatever you're waiting for the judge to say, if you just saw the evidence and look through this, it's like, this is, this is absurd. <clears throat> I was expecting there was going to be, you know, 30 or 60 days before the ruling, but I, I literally, I, I dumped the second 
the judge actually made his statement, kind of his his uh, pre warning of what his overall order was going to be, and that turned out to be good because I think I think BSV was at like at one twelve and Bit- Bitcoin Cash was below four hundred, but you know th- that just worked out lucky. But of course, it took. 2500 minutes to actually sell bsv which is a whole other <laughs> other aspect of this and 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 by the way i think this is a so the the micro payments aspect and some of the technology of, of this is great but i don't know how, what i people will always say in bsv well we have terra it does 1 million transactions per second but what makes this successful is it's the entire network it's the network effects it's the ecosystem no exchange is going to list this coin as long as these people are in charge of it. If you're going to have patent trolling and lawfare and a centralization of mining where the same guy that's running this whole circus has over 50% of the hash rate, it will never be successful. I don't care if it does 10 trillion transactions per second. Those bad actors um, will will sink the ship. And and I, you know, I don't know what way there is to resolve it because I, I there really are good people in in that community. And I don't know how to how to you know, get more alignment around big blocks and the importance. The other thing is there's this fetish in BSV. I'm sitting here saying we need to stop CBDCs. And Craig Wright is out here saying all CBDCs are going to run on BSV, which, by the way, is a completely naive take. Like the idea that central banks are looking for a permissionless blockchain is it's observably false. I mean, there are 133 countries pursuing CBDCs and at various phases. None of them are looking at, perm- they're, they're all permissioned technologies where they can have complete control. So I actually think either he sold himself on this idea and he sold the community on the fact that everybody's going to have to use BSV. And I think that that's, that's completely false. And so it's, it's, uh, it's been very frustrating, to be honest. Mm-hmm even trying to have an open conversation within that community around this idea of CBDCs. So, yeah, yeah, it's certainly crypto is a bit of a case study in anthropology. I think in many, in many ways, uh, certainly with the way it splits down and divides and different communities get onto different narratives and then that kind of meets reality and there's a large layer of, uh, you know, psychological uh, coping in the middle. And in every, in every crypto community, I don't care which one you talk to, they all have some uh, layer between what's happening in reality and what they kind of envision or they think is, is going to work out. And it's just different uh, from coin to coin. Maybe BSV worse than a lot of the others in, in many ways. But I'm sympathetic, like I've uh, said you know, before on this show that, yeah, of course, there are plenty of people in uh, BSV who got on the wrong track, but they, they've got the right idea, you know, in in some respects or another. Also, some of them have completely the wrong idea, but I, I'm not definitely writing off anybody who at least identified big block Bitcoin as probably closer to the mark. Um, yeah than otherwise okay so speaking about that we had the bitcoin halvening the bch halvening the fourth ever halvening on april the third at block eight hundred and forty thousand. so bch is now mining only 3.125 fresh coins per block this of course halved the uh just just about effectively halved the uh, reward for miners and as a result bch hash rate fell enormously leading to a significant backlog in quotation marks but there was actually no disruption so i've got it on the slide here this is the mempool of bch over though uh that period right after the halving so there was a ton more transactions in the mempool but because everybody is just transacting on zero confirmation i didn't actually see any complaining anywhere from anybody like oh my transactions not getting confirmed or i'm having problems with this service or maybe it happened but i didn't see anybody upset about that i don't know did did either of you anywhere no nothing oh. yeah it was because like sometimes you see people in telegram say like oh i've just sent to an exchange you know how long is this going to take it takes six blocks blah 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 like somebody who's new to the community and hasn't really got onto all those p2p networks but i just thought this was a fascinating case study in the big block methodology that it actually does work if your whole ecosystem's on zero conf then if there's a bit of a backlog then it's fine and then just miners chew through it when they get around to it and 
absolutely nothing is disrupted. So that was good to see. And the other uh, element was the profitability, which is on the next slide. So BCH profitability plummeted against uh, BTC. So the miners were actually mining at a at a loss because the BTC hadn't halved yet. So it was so much more relatively profitable. But then the miners just slowly like they've been mining at a loss. So they've done us a, a favor here. They could have just all stopped. But clearly there is appetite in the mining community to keep BCH as a project alive, which we've obviously seen before throughout crypto history. But this is another good reminder that the, the mining community knows that BCH is very valuable and it's important to keep it around. So they just slowly uh, mined at a loss you know, with a fraction of the hash power to mine it back into. So now profitability is equal and the situation will reverse when BTC uh, halves again, uh, then BCH will be massively more uh, profitable, at least for a short amount of time. So I don't know, what do you make of this whole halving uh, situation? Did you have a halvening party or are you excited that the inflation rate is dropping or it was just business as usual? Any uh, special comments on this? I mean, I didn't have a part, I, you know, I was just on 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 Twitter re retweeting information, but I, I think that was about what, what it is and, and then kind of leading leading up to it and trying to put out educational materials. So a lot of the people that I talk to, so I'm doing workshops across the country. I'm doing these four hour workshops based on my book where I'm explaining the threat of CBDCs. And then at the end, I, I'm actually giving people a self-custody crypto wallet, giving them gold and silver. So I, I my audience, it, well, but there's what's on Twitter, but the, the people that I'm actually reaching out to are people that have no idea what any of this is. I, I mean, if, if you, I went to 20 States last year and I would say in general, and particularly if you're dealing with boomers, which by the way, are an underserved market because in America they control 43% of the wealth. And yet, yet people have been like, Oh, well we write off boomers. This is just, this is new technology. It's like, well, so boomers are using Apple pay. They're using Google pay. They're using online banking. Like this isn't actually a stretch. And in fact, because of what happened with, with COVID um, a lot of people are now questioning central banking. So, so for me, a lot of this is trying to explain to people, like, like when you really take a step back, it's like trying to explain this to somebody brand new happening and all of this other stuff is, is, is interesting. And it's something I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to simplify explaining this to somebody that doesn't know anything about it. So, um, so, so I'm one part right in the middle of it and kind of like cheering it on. And then the other part, trying to figure out how do I describe to somebody that's on my feed that, that just read my book, what the hell all of this is about so yeah interesting it's a, balance it's a fascinating dynamic because i have the same thing in many respects like i often think of like my mom she's uh, having a dinner party she has some of her friends around right and on a couple of occasions it's been like oh here's you know here's my son jeremy and he's into crypto and blah blah, blah. and they say oh you know i've heard about that it's really interesting but it's not impacting their day-to-day -day life just yet but usually i'm able to say oh do you want to try it out and then they say nah, i don't know and then you say no no seriously it'll only take 20 seconds it's you know not a big deal like and, and blah blah blah. just make it a bit, bit more appealing and then send them a little bit of crypto and then explain it as currency that's always what i try and emphasize on like people understand currency i really try and say look you probably hear all this stuff about investing and speculation forget about all that you and i have just made a transaction right here i've sent you one dollar you've given me a physical dollar back that that also tends to really help people then see that they've made a, a trade and an exchange and they like that uh it wasn't like some charity or something and then uh you know from there it's much easier for them to kind of go okay it's like a currency and maybe it's not accepted everywhere where i shop just yet but conceivably in five or ten years it, it will be right so i think that's the way i've found to most connect to that audience whereas then the opposite is true if you're talking to younger people so recently we we're just talking on this twitter space and this guy uh, came in shout out if he's listening to the show uh, and he was talking about how he was doing online streaming of Call of Duty and he just stumbled onto this BCH community. He's 20 years old and he was the exact opposite because his mind is completely open to everything. So he was just like straight down the rabbit hole of like, what is this DeFi and what's going on with this coin and that coin and everything. He had all the curiosity 
built in rather than sort of the skepticism and needing to see the foundational idea like that was just let's go right so it's you've got to tailor the message depending on who you're talking to definitely you've definitely got to tailor the message but i to me it's it's mind-blowing how many people have no idea that cryptocurrency was designed to be a currency like like i, I would say with the audience that i talk to 80 percent of them are not even aware of that use case and that is that's almost criminal in a way how how distorted the message has gotten. I mean, the kinds of questions that I get are just not the kinds of questions that you would, would normally expect. People don't realize there are different versions of Bitcoin. I, I mean, I think a lot of people associate Sam Bankman Freed with crypto more than even having heard of Satoshi Nakamoto. I mean, it's just, it's crazy trying to like cut through all of the different layers of this, but people are more receptive to it. When I, when I first, you know, launched this book and started talking about this, it was way out there. And now it's actually, it's not mainstream, but there's the, there's substantially larger demand to hear about this than there was a year ago. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. I just, I hope we have enough time to onboard enough people. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's talk about that. Right. So you've got the book and CBDCs is coming. And like I said, it's been mentioned on this show. Certainly I would say, you know, the show has been running now nearly four years, right? So, or three and a bit years. So 2020, one, we sort of brought it up and then 2022, again, we we're keeping an eye on it. But around the end of 2022, I remember we started predicting on this show, CBDCs is really going to start to kick in. And then all of last year, it was like, it's coming. There was the Fed now stuff that came out, you know, Project Hamilton. We, we talked about that on the show, right? And then it's like 2024, it feels like it's going to be this year or next year, right? That it's really going to start to hit so i think most of my audience are pretty familiar with this topic in general terms but in your own words what's the likely timeline and the basic breakdown of cbdc's what can we expect to be seeing as this rolls out so at a at a global level i think in 2020 there were 32 countries that were at the early stage of exploring cbdc's like like maybe china had done an implementation. China started their process in 2014, but but you only had 30 countries looking at it. Today, there are 133 countries at various stages of exploration, piloting, or actually full rollout of CBDCs. There are more than eight countries that have rolled out CBDCs. I believe there are 1.3 billion CBDC accounts now globally, which is more than the number of, of crypto uh, decentralized crypto accounts. So if you look almost at the, all in China, though, right? Like of uh, what? A, a lot in China. There's some in India. There's there's a lot in the Eastern Caribbean, and there, and there are some pilots that are going on that are not just necessarily just retail. But 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 yeah, I mean India's. So I mean, you take China and India, like you're getting into yes, a big, <laughs> pretty big chunk. And what China shows you, by the way, is that this can happen at scale because there's a lot of complacency that says, oh well, yeah, they do it in a small Eastern Caribbean country, but they're not going to be able to roll it out in the United States. And that's that's just simply not true from a technical perspective. So the rate of adoption has has just skyrocketed. And again, so from so it's it's more CBDC accounts than than crypto accounts. That should be alarming to people. That as a fact in and of itself should be alarming. You have multiple groups. You have the UN, WEF, IMF, World Bank, and Bank of International Settlements working together to coordinate a lot of this. They work on handbooks and guides to helping countries. You'll see a lot of countries, you know, Nigeria had a disastrous rollout, but they're still keeping it and they're actually still actually expanding the program. And I talked to some people in Nigeria and they asked me, it's like, well, why did we even implement this. Nobody in Nigeria was asking for a CBDC. And I'm like, when you follow this, it was the World Bank and the IMF. They actually push from the top down. They use financial incentives and then they come in and actually implement the technology, all permissioned solutions that are controlled from the top down. The part that was alarming to me and there's some conspiracy aspect to this and, and reading Roger's book and there's some other things that I actually still need to be dug into because I think I think Bitcoin was hijacked, and I think we really should try to get to the bottom of exactly what all of this was about. Because in the US, there have been three successful CBDC pilots. One is Project Hamilton, and Project Hamilton was uh, done between 2020 and 2022, and it was a collaboration of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and the MIT 
multimedia lab. Now, what you'll find with all three of these CBDC pilots, the MIT multimedia lab was involved. The head of that MIT multimedia lab was a guy named uh, Joy Ito. And he now, it's been documented, received surreptitious funding from Jeffrey Epstein. He also separately, outside of MIT, provided some of the funding for SegWit. He actually funded uh, some of the developers, including Corey Fields, who worked on SegWit and is also a co-author of Project Hamilton. Yes. So, so, the, so for people to put this in perspective, depending upon what your, you know, your viewpoint on this, my, my viewpoint of it is that, I, you know, Bitcoin was hijacked and, and in, in the story intentionally shifted from peer to peer pat, got cash, digital cash to digital gold. And, and interestingly, Jeffrey Epstein did one interview on this topic in 2017. And Epstein said he believes that Bitcoin is is a store of value and will, it will not be a currency. So I, I find it odd and we don't know the exact connections, but that, you know, Epstein in 2017 is out talking about the digital gold case and then also funding Joy Ito, both through the MIT Multimedia Lab and privately, who then went on to work on all three US CBDC pilots and fund SegWit. I mean, those are facts. Whether do we have the smoking gun? We don't. But boy, we should be looking at this, in my opinion. So this... Um, this project Hamilton could do what uh, 1.7 million transactions per second is what came out of the pilot. And at the end of the pilot, they said, well, the technology works. There were a couple of things that they kinks to work out, but we really need to focus on the legality and how to market this to people. I've spoken to devs who have worked on a couple of these different US CBDC projects, and they've actually said that project Hamilton worked out whatever remaining technical bugs there are, and it's now closer to 1.9 million transactions per second. But what people should be the most worried about when you look at these three CBDC projects is this thing called regulated liability network. And, you know, that is a really boring name. And the white paper is, is incredibly boring. I mean, I, like it was actually hard to stay awake, but, but it's like one of these things where you, they give it the boring name because of what the treachery is that's behind it. Like when you read this thing and you dig into it, it's like, okay, what are they trying to do? Who's involved in this? Well, it's the um, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, several large New York banks, the Bank of International Settlements, MIT, and the whole idea of regulated liability network is to create a ledger, an Uber ledger for everything. And their vision of the future is all CBDCs and all digital assets not non-CBDC, are tracked on one common system, centralized system, that multiple third parties can monitor, track, and regulate. So, I mean, the idea here is, let's imagine a future where you can't, you, you, there's no cash. You go to the store, you buy a new computer at the Apple store, your computer's given a digital ID. That digital ID is associated with your CBDC. If the government decides they don't like your speech or your social credit score drops, they can not only shut off access to your money, they can shut off access to your assets and your ability to even trade your assets. That's literally what they're building. So I will see people... I've been a huge fan of tokenization. I've actually been involved with Ravencoin like since the since the beginning of that. I like the idea of of being able to tokenize and trade anything of any size anywhere in the world peer to peer without third parties, right? Great idea. Like it could revolutionize stocks, it could revolutionize we've seen the use case of NFTs, but you can literally digitize and trade anything on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Regulated liability network is the dystopian case of that. So if the idea behind the Bitcoin white paper was to have peer-to-peer -peer cash with no third parties in the middle, uh, and CBDC is the opposite of that, it's a digital version that's completely controlled, um, the ability to have peer-to-peer -peer tokens is the decentralized freedom-based case and regulated liability network is the dystopian case, but that's what they're building. And they are full steam ahead on this. So we saw last week that Argentina is now saying that you have to register your digital assets. One of the same developers, by the way, that I spoke with that works on these US CBDCs is taking a, a new job. And, and so you know, before taking that job and signing the NDA, he said, look out for enhanced enforcement of anti-money laundering laws in the United States and look at and look towards you having to register your digital assets in the United States. So this is kind of what's going on 
in the United States right now. Project Cedar is a retail CBDC project done with the Federal Reserve um, of New York and, and BIS and some others as well. So, so those are the three pilots. Now, what's worrying about this is President Biden signed Executive Order 14067 on March the 9th, 2022, which basically authorized the United States government to explore a CBDC while at the same time taking a whole of government approach to cracking down on digital assets. And I, we are feeling this. I mean, if you are in crypto, so this is why for me, I'm okay, I've been living off of crypto since 2019. My friend Ian's in jail. All of these people, Caitlin Long's, her bank thing is getting rejected by the feds. I, you know, people that I know that have been in crypto for 10 years are, we're, we're, you know, like we're in the middle of a war and we're kind of on the ropes. We're being attacked by all sides. Well, there's an executive order authorizing this. So the SEC cracking down, the Fed's looking at all this stuff, local Bitcoin's being shut down. Like they, they really want to shut this off. And in fact, I might do another interview with the guy, uh, Stephen Neroff, who uh, Project uh, Veritas, or maybe not, excuse me, not Veritas, uh, James O'Keefe just interviewed. He's involved in this big Ethereum kind of scandal. And I guess the story was that he was extorted by the DOJ. Uh, they claimed that he was involved in extortion and, and threatened to throw him in jail for extortion, which seems to be a bogus claim. And what they wanted in exchange for that was to hit, for him to give up dirt on pro-liberty people, OGs in the crypto space, particularly, and it's already been named people like Naomi Brockwell. I believe Roger was on this list. I believe the DOJ literally went after him and tried to basically use him to get dirt on people that have been pushing the pro-liberty case of crypto. So I've gotten a little bit off track, but, but there's the executive order authorizing the CBDCs. The tech already exists. Fed now is implemented. And so when I like say this is DEFCON 1, we need to be worried about this. Let's look at how big legislation gets passed in the United States that strips people of their rights and strips people of their resources. We got the Patriot Act 45 days after 9-11. We got the TARP Act, which which bailed out the banks and then added some bank secrecy stuff. There's a bunch of stuff that kind of came after that um, 18 days after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And then the two point two trillion dollar CARES Act was passed 16 days after COVID was declared a pandemic and it passed on a voice vote. In fact, there are people in Congress that have voted for all three of these things that are still there. So these things happen in an emergency. They happen using this problem reaction solution approach where you either manufacture a problem or a problem naturally emerges. There's a fear response to it. And then you already have the solution ready to roll out. Well, the solution is already it has already been developed. The CBDC solution is already there. The Federal Reserve has CBDC on their list of goals, despite what Powell will say in a public setting. CBDCs are a top goal of the Federal Reserve. So for me, I sit here looking at this and, and you know, so I, I ran for president and I, one of the things I did is I spoke to a lot of other people running for president um, and I spoke to members of Congress. You know, for instance, Ted Cruz in the U.S. Senate put in a bill to prevent the Federal Reserve from basically violating the Constitution and creating a CBDC without congressional approval. He, you, you should, he shouldn't even have to put that bill in. It didn't even go up for a vote in 2013 or 2023. And it's, he brought it up again this year. And he even told me when I met with him, he's like, this is dead in the water. So if people are sitting there saying, well, Congress will never allow this, there's no support in Congress right now to even stop the Federal Reserve from doing something that's already unconstitutional. So what you can imagine happening is there's a terrorist attack or there's a cyber attack and you can see what the logic is going to be. Well, the terrorists are using cash and they're using cryptocurrency. So to keep us all safe, we need to move to the CBDC system and it will get bipartisan support. Republicans and Democrats will vote for it just like they did TARP, CARES and the Patriot Act. So that's why I'm like... There is no political solution to this. I've been a political actor. I've been close to politics for like 30 years and I've spent a lot of time on it. There is no political solution for this. In 2022, 100% of US Senate incumbents won re-election. 94.5% of the House won re-election. We're looking at Trump versus Biden. We, things are going to be 98% the same 
coming out of the 2024 election. It's already baked in because literally those are the only choices that are even there. So you're not going to stop CBDCs politically. The only thing that we can do is to take direct action. And so what I've been encouraging people to do and what I've done is get your money out of the bank. No, don't start using cash because there's a lot of confusion around this. Cash is just cash is also fiat. The problem here is fiat currency. It's government currency. Get out of fiat currency, move into self-custody crypto, gold and silver and start using those in a parallel economy for day-to-day -day transactions. Because if you can create a network and you can start buying and selling things, then you can protect yourself from when they come in and force you to basically convert your fiat currency into CBDCs. So I, I believe that we could have CBDCs. I'm not saying that how high the probability is, but it's very possible that this happens before the 2024 election. And when I ran for president, one of the things I did is I, I put together a pledge to try to get other presidential candidates to sign that says, yes, if elected, you know, I'll veto all of those things. But the more important part of the pledge was if they try to implement CBDCs before the 2024 election, then I will use my platform as a candidate to suggest to the people that follow me that they exit the dollar and move into self-custody crypto, gold and silver and using it in a parallel economy. That's Frankly, the only good use of the political process is to try to get the other candidates to use their voice to get people to take direct action. So, so I'm very worried about it because once CBDCs are implemented, I mean, to me, it's, it's kind of like it's the gateway to social credit systems. It's the great gateway to digital IDs and vaccine passports. It's essentially the end of free will. So I narrowed everything down to like if we don't stop this whatever your other political issue is that's liberty-based, you're not even going to have the ability to fight it because the people you're fighting against are going to be able to shut off access to your money with the click of a mouse button. Yes. And so, I mean, like you say, that's 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 a short time frame, right? I mean, obviously, we'll see by the end of this year whether or not <laughs> that comes to pass, but whether it's this year or next year, certainly, or, you know, maybe, maybe the year after, right? It's going to... It's going to have, and like you're describing, you think that it will come out far faster than like, because I think of people sitting there, even myself, right? And we have this idea like CBDCs are going to be announced. The government goes on TV. We're doing like in Nigeria, whatever they did with the e-Naira, right? We're going to uh, roll out our new CBDC and you see it on the nightly news and you think, okay, well, whatever. And then uh, there's some sort of mishaps and it bumbles along and your local shop person talks about it, but they tell you a story about how the guy at the government office was incompetent and da, 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 you know, and things bumble along, right? So there's this like long time frame before the government actually rolls this out. Whereas you're painting the picture of it's going to be announced or jammed through, you know, in some kind of emergency and then bam, it's going to be in your face. Like you have to use this. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the reason that I say that, because, because people are thinking, oh, they'll announce it and then they still have to build it. What people aren't realizing is they've already built it. They actually, did, no one is talking about project Hamilton from 2020 to 2022. Nobody's talking about the fact that Gavin Andreessen was involved in that project for a little while as well. And he left and, and I'd love to get more information on that, but they built the technology. They piloted the technology. They've been refining the technology. That's the part that people don't know. And then they rolled out fed. Now fed now is not a CBDC, but fed now is an infrastructure structure on top of which you can roll out a CBDC. By the way, that came faster than people uh, could possibly imagine. By the time I started reporting on this and educating people on this, they actually hit their July of last year date for rolling out FedNow. People are already accustomed in the United States to using electronic payment systems. People are already like, uh, unlike Nigeria, but and think about it in Nigeria, they rolled it out and, and people were, didn't are, people were not already using electronic payment systems. There was a much higher use of physical cash in Nigeria than in the United States. But look at what they've been doing with physical cash. Sweden no longer has physical cash. Are you in Australia? Aren't they aren't they moving to ban cash in, well, in I'm Australia? Not, I'm not, I'm in the UK at the at oh, the moment, but oh, they yeah, did yeah. you know they, they certainly when I was back in Australia in uh recently, you know, yeah, things are, you know, fairly cashless in a lot of in a lot of parts of it. And there was recently some stuff with people trying to like save cash and withdraw cash from the ATMs and, and stuff like that. But like you've described, I think a lot of the people who are involved in that haven't really come to appreciate the full scale of 
what they're dealing with because in their mind, like that's the system. We need to preserve the system and sort of stop it getting eroded away. But it's it's kind of like picking up pennies in front of a steamroller, right? Like they don't really realize that the next thing is going to be this digital rollout that even if some people are like, we like cash or whatever, they're not going to riot on the streets about it. Uh, certainly, especially in somewhere like Australia, where you've already fairly conditioned the population off that system, right? So there's not going to be this huge outcry. There's not going to be like, I think whatever that quote is, you know, liberty dies not with a bang, but with a whimper or some, something like that, that kind of an idea, right? It's people don't really s- see it coming until suddenly it's right in their face. And then it's kind of like, well, that's just the way things are now, you know, whether it's like with the pandemic, right? And that was different around the world. And certainly people were in all kinds of, scenarios with that but it was like pretty quick from like oh okay maybe get a vaccine to like you can't come into this restaurant if you don't have proof that you've been vaccinated right and you could see a similar kind of thing repeat here and yeah i think people who are trying to resist it with okay we've got to keep casual that's good i'm not saying they're doing the wrong thing but i think they really need to realize it's cbdc's or crypto there is no timeline where cash emerges and spreads back to the whole population and everybody gives up their electronic bank cards that's not happening no and and they've been cracking down on the number of atms banks have been shutting down across europe and even the united states you're seeing restricted access to atms and we always like to say to people it, and people don't know this people are not taught about fiat currency right every fiat currency in human history has failed um, there's a guy that did an analysis of 775 fiat currencies. They all failed. The average one only lasts 27 years. And there's a list of like seven main reasons that I put in the book why these things fail. And if you economic mismanagement, overspending, technology, and if you look at what all of those are, then the dollar is is flashing bright red on every indicator of a fiat currency that is collapsing. But most people, because the dollar has been the global reserve currency their entire life, it's not even in the realm of possibility that the dollar could go away. So that's one chunk that you've got to educate people on. But the reason I'm expressing this urgency is part of it is so like living off of crypto, look at just what happened with Fed now. So with Fed now, this is an interesting case. There were four banks that collapsed, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, Silvergate Bank, and First Republic Bank. Two of those banks, Silvergate and um, Signature, actually had offerings that were competitive to FedNow. So they actually had a, a, an easy way to onboard, kind of handle the fiat crypto situation that was a threat to FedNow. You could make the case that the runs on those banks were engineered in part by the Federal Reserve and others specifically to eliminate competition. And so it's even more when you look at it, I think it was Signature, um, when they when they shut down these banks and basically sold them off, one of the things that they put in the terms and conditions for Signature is whoever acquires this bank can't get into the crypto space for at least five years. So Bank of New York, Mellon, actually bought uh, Signature Bank, but under the terms and conditions that they can't even get into crypto. So... What I'm saying is, you know, I'm looking at Ian in jail. I'm looking at local Bitcoins being shut down. I'm looking at you see people constantly getting limits put on them in terms of the inability to use their bank account to buy crypto and those amounts. Like we actually don't have a lot of time to get people out of fiat and into crypto. I hope I'm wrong about if if it if it does happen before this election, then no matter how much I say about this, we're probably in trouble. But we know that they're closing off the on and off ramps anyway. We know that it's, I mean, it is harder to actually use crypto today than it was four years ago. Even from my perspective, I have to do like weird stuff now. It's never been easy. It should be easy to use crypto, but it's not easy. I mean, a gift card, you gotta like, there are so many different pieces and, and, and those things go down. You know, BitPay offered a debit card. The banking relationship that they had fell apart. They haven't renewed it yet, right? So we know that their intent is a CBDC. We know that they're using the whole of government to, to cramp to clamp down. So this is why I'm saying I don't know how to express urgency any more than it isn't going to be any easier 
30 or 60 days from now for us to get people out of fiat into crypto, whether they flip the switch this year or next year, it's only going to get harder. The longer we wait, the more difficult it becomes for us. And I think it's, I don't see how CBDCs coexist with decentralized cryptocurrency. So, and, and I think there's even more of a movement here at the end where it's a one world government situation with one, one C, even if you call it a CBDC, one digital currency and one social credit system. And th this is when you look at the UN Agenda 2030 and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, I've actually looked at that. That, it, that is kind of the basis of what a social credit system would look like. And with those Sustainable Development Goals, they want to regulate every aspect of our lives, where we live, where we work, healthcare, education, food. They want to regulate the air, the sea, and the land. Literally, their view is that only scientists and engineers are smart enough to solve these scarcity-based problems for humanity. And so we've got to give them the power to do it. And, and the way to do it is through these digital tracking systems. And actually, it's when you study the history of this, the actual digital currency is going to be essentially based on energy credits. This idea goes back to the 1930s. So in other words, they want to control all energy production and consumption and use that as the basis for what you can buy and sell based on how they define your carbon carbon output. So we're, we're literally competing against that level of centralization. And that level of centralization does not coexist alongside peer-to-peer -peer digital cash or people engaging in voluntary trade. They, they view us as, as being uh, just a, a resource drain on the planet. And, and it's up to these sci heroic scientists and engineers from the top down to save, to save us from ourselves. So I think that's what's at stake. Yes. I mean, you, you have those just to try and make it a bit more approachable. You know, you have people online posting these memes about like, you will own nothing and you'll be happy from the World Economic Forum and you'll eat the bugs and like all, all this kind of stuff, which is trying to just distill down this idea that there is certainly some kind of momentum towards people not having as much control over their own life. Like, I mean, I don't know for me, when I um, like booking a plane flight, you know, and they have that <laughs> box on there now, which is like tick this to like offset your carbon credits. I sort of see like, that's something that people can see today that maybe wasn't there 10 years ago and sort of see, okay, what if this just ratcheted up a step? What if it was like, you have to pay for the credits or you don't fly on the plane. And then what if it was like, well, you've already uh, taken three flights this year. So your, your credit allocation is, is too much, right? We're certainly not, not that far off from that just being the new system, right? We're not far off. And if you, when you study, I, so in writing the book, I started studying the history of this and the term technocracy was coined in 1919. And there was actually a, an organization formed called Technocracy Inc. in 1931. And you can even see their documents online still. The whole idea behind this technocracy thing is not only to have scientists and engineers control things, but to, to flip the economy from being a price-based system to literally being based on energy credits. This, this is an idea that goes back to 1931, and they've got docu you know, I don't know how they would have possibly technically administered something like that in 1930. The fact that they were even trying to think about that level of, of, of authoritarianism is mind boggling, but you, you could do it now, right? This is why one of the big pushes has been ESG and it hasn't been successful, but, but that was the first movement. Like this was like trillions of dollars of investment. This was a big push on ESG and already getting this carbon system in place. And so we know what they're trying. They like none of what I'm saying is a conspiracy theory. I, and in fact, in my book, all of this, the, the source material for this are these organizations themselves and these people in their own words. So there's no conspiracy about what they're trying to do, whether they're successful or not is up to us. But actually what they're doing is the default unless we do something else. And having been involved in politics for 30 years, my stepmother like started out in the Republican Party at like the low level as a like Broward County, Florida Republican, and ended up the co-chair of the Republican National Committee. Ended up being Trump's uh, uh, 
ambassador to Costa Rica. And uh, so I've seen this political process from the inside out. We, we are not going to fix this political process. We're not going to solve the problems that we're talking about here. And I've tried, I've run PACs, I've run for office and everything else. And I, I like, like there's a, you look at it and it's like, no, this is up to us taking direct action. So it's challenging because I'm trying to express urgency. And it's like, so one part of it is gonna be, well, this sounds like a conspiracy theory. It's not, but are you gonna sit down and listen to me talk about it? And are you gonna read the book and look? Um, and then it's also getting people to take that first step, which is why I'm doing these workshops. So, because there are a lot of people that I'll give like an hour long talk and they walk away. It's like, oh my God, this is horrible, which is not entirely a fun thing. Like going around and scaring people is actually not fun or even something that I want to do. I'd, right, right, I'd rather empower people. So, so now this is why I've added this component of making sure that they actually have a wallet and gold and silver so that they can begin their journey. Because for a lot of people, it's scary to take that first step. That's one of the things that Roger did that early on, which is why he got the Bitcoin Jesus name is, is I mean, yeah, it, it, free state project events. He gave everybody at Porkfest Bitcoin. Like, I don't even know when that was 2012. There is nothing better. It's, it's like you said, the best way to explain this to people is to give them some and let them let them use it. But we've got to do this on like an industrial scale right now based on the time frame that I think that we're looking at. And I think in general, most people are complacent about it or they're unaware of the problem or like the fighting is at, is a different level. Like this is why the thing with BTC is frustrating to me. It's like this idea that people think BTC is one or that the market has spoken. and and it hasn't. People are using fiat. People are using Venmo. People and CBDCs are are ramping up faster than crypto. So none of us are winning, and 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 freedoms are not winning. Uh, peer to peer transactions aren't winning, but they could. We just have to put a focus and attention on it. That's how I got to kind of BCH. I mean, I had been using BCH, but what I've realized is we're so late in the in the game here that. We need an ecosystem, right? I mean, there are a lot of people that say, well, this technology is a little bit better or this, or here's a new thing. It's like, yeah, but, but Bitcoin Cash actually is already integrated with exchanges. It's already integrated with an ecosystem for use as peer-to-peer -peer cash. It already has a market cap. The network effects are, are already, you can't replace the network effects. We're in the bottom of the ninth inning in this battle of centralized tyranny versus freedom we need to go with the best shot that we have. And at this point, I actually think that that's, that's BCH. So I'm trying to put as much energy as I can around that and onboarding people to, to BCH as possible. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, I agree with you about that. And this show has and always <laughs> will be, I guess, a Bitcoin cash maximalist thing for the same reason. It's not that there's any malice towards any other project. And I'm glad people have projects and they can do things however they want. But the network effect is just killer. Like you need people who are serious. And that's just that's just how it goes you can't oh we'll have this and this and this like that's not going to win firstly you're going to lose against people who are all in on the thing that they're doing and it's like trying to play you know be like i'm going to be an olympic athlete at uh javelin and tennis and basketball no you're not you've already lost to the guy who is doing javelin and nothing else like it's game over and so for the same reason bch and especially with the network effect of money like you just you just have to be all in so i agree with you about that element of it you're saying that we need better like peer-to-peer -peer onboarding in terms of evangelizing to people do you have any like specific because i think of the bch community where i think the community is already doing a pretty good job as it is it could maybe be a little more urgent although everybody's already famous for being shilling it so hard if you were you know handing out advice what 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 are we doing wrong or how do we really break through on the on the narrative i, I don't even know that it's necessarily doing anything wrong I, it, and it's hard because we we, we there are 20,000 coins and the narrative has been split. And I, and I do think Bitcoin was hijacked. And so now we have to undo people's perception that this is only an investment vehicle. So I, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that it's that anybody's doing anything wrong. I, we, we just need 10,000 times the number of people doing it. And, and, you know, for instance, in the U S so the, here's the thing, it's a controlled demolition of fiat, right? They're, they're, they're intentionally destroying it. We, we've gone from being based on the gold standard to then 
having 10% reserve requirements for banks and a fractional reserve system to then under COVID getting rid of the fractional reserve requirements. So banks are no longer required to have any customer deposits. And so what are, so when you go to take your money out of the bank, what are you relying on? Well, you're relying on commercial loans, residential loans, student loans, auto loans, credit card debt to be paid off. That's not happening. We're nearing like 2008 levels already. So they know that this is a, this is a controlled demolition. And so, so the question is, how do we get people to understand the urgency of it? And I, you know, so to me, I, the way I look at it is we need more people. So I, I'm doing these workshops, but I can only get in front of so many people. I'm doing as many of these as I can. And I'm going to make an online version of it, but only after I've done enough iterations that I know I can communicate this so that th the standard is a boomer with minimal technical e expertise needs to be able to participate in the workshop and walk away enlightened and empowered to start using self-custody assets for day-to-day -day transactions. That is my bar for doing all of this. And then eventually I want to make that an online thing. But even still, we have to get to probably two to 3% of people exiting fiat and using self-custody assets as an alternative in a parallel economy so that we have something that we can show people is an alternative, right? Because they're going to do problem, reaction, solution. We're going to have a cyber attack. We're going to have a terrorist attack. Everybody's going to be afraid. We can't, we can't, solve the fact that there's going to be a manufactured problem or a real problem. We can't address or, or solve the fact that fear is what is going to be preyed upon and that that is actually an effective thing to play off of. The only thing that we can do is have an alternative solution when they push their solution that can be adopted at scale. So the question is, how can we get ourselves ready at capacity? And the thing for me, the reason I got, I got wedged into the whole BSV thing is I was unaware of the block size changing thing. I think that's huge. This, this uh, thing in 45. Well, yes. That is massively huge. Because in my book, I've got a table of trends. So that is a, a big thing that gives it capacity. I don't have, have the answer other than to say that we, so it's, it's how do we get people not only have B, BCH, but how do we get retailers to start taking it? And, and even in New Hampshire, I mean, now that Ian is in, like there's a tapering of, I mean, the FBI rated not only Ian, but they raided some of the restaurants and some of the businesses that were accepting crypto. So what I'm saying is it's it's not a fault of, of what we're doing. I, I'm trying to like, express how under attack we actually are in terms of it is a whole of government approach. So there's the onboarding people to get Bitcoin cash. And then there's the how do we make the solutions better? How do we make it so that what we have is easier than Venmo, easier than Zelle? How do we make it so that we have the simplest, easiest technology to use? And I, I use the boomer with limited tech as the standard for this. This is one of the things that frustrates me about Lightning Network is it's like this idea that it has to be. It's like, OK, I've got, you know, my social status and my social standing is based on my ability to use something that's complex and that somehow that actually my identity is associated with this and somehow I'm a cool kid because I've got this thing that's really hard to use that doesn't work that it's not as accessible to other people that's essentially how lightning occurs to me as it's rolled out we need something that's better than what fiat has to offer and I don't know I, I don't know where we are with 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 all of that I saw Roger posted something about like a touch to pay like it was it was essentially it's a Google pay or Apple pay type service that integrates uh, Bitcoin cash but I when I looked into it it was in Europe it's not in the United States yet so whatever we can do to get you know e even easier technology to make it more usable that will help as well. Yeah, so let me let me pitch you on this uh, alternative idea that I have there because I agree with you, and obviously it, you're right. We need a you know critical critical mass, which yeah, maybe two, three percent, maybe five percent, whatever it is, of people bought into crypto, and unfortunately, the whole digital cash mission has been swept away in this whole uh, hype and paranoia, uh, not hype and paranoia, hype and speculation, right? And then you also have the fact that it's now split down into all these different cryptos. And then you have the fact that a lot of people bought into all these Kool-Aid narratives about BTC. So we're not only fighting the bad guys, we're fighting all these propagandized fools at the same time and all of that, right? And like you've been talking about, okay, we can do in-person meetups, which you sort of mentioned, we can do retail onboarding. 
Uh, we can make better payment tools like tap to pay cards and stuff like that. But all those th three things the community has tried and only had very moderate to limited success at, right? So here's my pitch for instead, like you, we said, we've got, you know, a limited time frame and we got to make a critical impact. To me, that's kind of like, uh, you know, that's like bows and arrows. That's like going out, shooting the deer one by one. You know, we need like a nuclear bomb, right? Uh, so for my pitch is that's why, well, I'm creating the show, obviously, but if we can create a speculative mania in BCH, which is not something that it's ever really had before, although we've been seeing in the last few weeks as the <clears> price <throat> has been ramping up, people will be getting inside. Suddenly it's getting traction and eyeballs, right? And then if if that cycle starts enough that it can create a flippening with BTC by sucking out the hash rate, you because that's the number one marketing tool in any crypto that has proven to work, it's just rising price and speculative FOMO. And that could be enough to get the community the resources it needed at the same time as um, also destroying all these, you know, fake narratives and, and whatever, right? So I don't know necessarily what is the best way for us to create that mania besides getting the word out, spreading adoption and doing all those things you already mentioned. But I feel like, especially on a six or nine month time frame, that's what it would take is that kind of speculative mania, which just became breaking news all throughout crypto and everybody piled in for fear of missing out. Well, I, I think that would certainly that would help. I mean, that would obviously bring attention to it. I, I think the only downside to that is that, that do people we have to get people accustomed to actually using it as cash because if they're not using it as cash and then the music stops and then they don't know how to use it and they just think it's a speculative asset then we're actually we're still kind of stuck but but if if but anything that would increase like I, I you know people should be investing in it because it's actually the real bitcoin and the real vision of bitcoin obviously that we we've, we've tried that and I, but i don't know to what so I published a, not even a review, but a, a thing about I, I finished Roger's book and I put a really short blurb on it. And I was amazed at how I got attacked by by everyone, Adam back, everything. Else. I believe there's a lot of latent energy and anger and frustration with people about this. I, I don't think that the block size war has has been won by any stretch of the imagination. And I think people are because of the experience that they've had trying to use BTC as money because of the failure of Lightning Network. I, I, so I, I guess I would say, I think there's, there are a couple of things. Trying to raise awareness about the threat of CBDCs is one thing. We, if we look back at you know, 2017, well, what's different? Well, what's different is we've had COVID, right? We've had COVID tyranny. People are waking up about the overreach of government. That's actually part of why excuse me, I'm at the Brownstone Institute because the Brownstone Institute was basically the only group where all these liberty groups that historically were supposed to be the ones that defended individual freedom and they, they completely failed on lockdowns, they completely failed on mandates and they didn't even address the censorship industrial complex aspect of this. And so I can tell you through Brownstone, the people that I talked to at those events, those are people that in 2017 would be nowhere on our radar in terms of talking about looking at using digital currency, P2P currency for, for, uh, for digital cash. Now they're eager to host events and invite all of their friends and family. So we have a different, there's a different thing going on kind of in terms of the, the zeitgeist and where people are. Now, those are still just early adopters. That's not mainstream yet, but that is a whole addressable market that is untouched within crypto, right? Like it's, it's crypto Twitter is completely different from the group of people that I'm talking to, but those people actually are awake about government overreach and they're awake about um, now the Federal Reserve and inflation. We didn't have the inflation narrative either in 2017, right? So we are in a situation where, again, I wish it were mainstream, but there are millions of people in this country that are now like, well, wait a minute, this inflation is ridiculous. What's going on with the Federal Reserve? People are actually starting to question the Federal Reserve. They're starting to question 
fiat currency. People are aware of what's going on with BRICS. People are looking at some of these things. So I wouldn't look at necessarily where things were seven years ago as being the same as they are today. I think the world is a completely different place. How we get that message elevated and how we get that message out to people um, is a challenge. But I, I mean, I, I, I do think that it's possible. And I'm hoping that, you know, again, these workshops and everything else are, are, are one part of it. I hope Roger, I don't know if Roger's getting back involved. Like, I don't, I don't know fully. I mean, I read the book. I hope he's re-engaging. That's actually going to be huge. But we need like thousands of people to be like, this isn't a nice to have. This isn't, look at how cool it is to have peer-to-peer -peer cash. If we aren't successful spreading this peer-to-peer -peer cash, then you are going to be in a pod. You are going to be eating bugs. You are going to be in a place like Canada. I mean, if you read my book, I mean, one of the things to me is like, you look at the slippery slope of the MAID program, right? Oh, we're going to sell you this thing about compassionate end-of-life care, right? And in 2022, 10,000 people were killed using this program or whatever. And then, and then last year, it's 13,000 people. It's now the fourth leading cause of death in Canada. And you have a 20... This is euthanasia for people that oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, don't know. Yeah. Yeah, this is euthanasia. So you have a 28-year-old a uh, woman who's going to who has autism and and the, the response is, is is euthanasia you have a a woman who um uh, lost her her arms and legs in military service in canada and who asked the government for a wheelchair and was offered euthanasia you have people calling up in their 20s and 30s saying i can't get a girlfriend and i'm depressed and they're offering euthanasia it's not far off and it's not a stretch based on this slippery slope thing that you know if your social credit score drops this is going to be an intervention they're actually starting to try to glorify literally ending your own life so if you're if you if this is these are the stakes so to me i don't I, you know again i'm going to play around with this but i think if more people in the community could start focusing on what complete digital tyranny looks like if we don't have a peer-to-peer -peer alternative in terms of these things like social credit scores and MAID and, and all of the things that they can do with programmable CBDCs. I think if we shift that to being the narrative instead of the narrative being store value versus medium of exchange and all of the internal stuff, like to me, I don't look at BTC as the competitor. BTC's already failed as as peer to peer cash. Now it's just a nuisance. Like it's like exposing the hijacking of it is important, but it's certainly not in any way competitive as far as being peer to peer cash. And I think I you, I think you liked it or whatever or commented on it. I I, I just did a a table of how many users are using Venmo, PayPal, Zelle, and everything else versus. BTC, whether that stat that they have is, is accurate or not, it, it may not. It's probably even exaggerated. But the point is, Bitcoin has lost. In 2009, those, those alternatives didn't exist. They had 0% market share. I should turn that into a graph. Like, like BTC has yes, completely that would be failed. Amazing. Yes. It's completely failed. And we need to be worried about that. There's another really interesting aspect in the United States. And there are a lot more people that hold this view than I thought. They actually view CBDCs as being the mark of the beast. They view this as an end times situation. Like there are millions and millions and millions of people who think that. And so that is not an audience that we had in 2017. So I think the landscape is different. So when I think of what do we need? Well, we need people with enough money to exit fiat, to actually have an impact on the fiat system. And so, um, and, and, you know, Bitcoin Cash is for everyone, but I think like boomers with high net worth that are looking at COVID tyranny, looking at, at some of these other components, these are people that have never, I, I can tell you from doing these meetings, they're not familiar with anything of what we're talking about. It's a complete open area for us. It's hard to reach these people. And, and a lot of it actually has to be in person. I mean, as much as I'd like to say, I'll just do an online course, nothing beats meeting with somebody in person, talking to somebody in person, shaking their hand, listening to them, answering their questions and having a conversation. You, it's not scalable, but you know, we need 10,000 Bitcoin Jesuses, not, not one. Like that, honestly, that's probably the way that we're gonna have the, the most adoption. And the way I'm looking at it is I'm getting early adopters now. These are people that have never been in crypto before so that when that time comes, when that emergency is there, we're kind of building an army of people that can go out and, and explain and onboard people. I mean, again, this is just one. So this is just one thing that I've come up with. And again, I, I, I'm I'm probably more extreme 
on this, but I think if you read the book and you look at this, people really should be worried about this. This should be a, this is DEF CON 1. This is about free will versus determinism. This is about centralization versus decentralization. This is not, this is not about alt season and whose coin is going to pump and number go up. Because after this cycle, there is there is no cycle. They will. There is no the cycle. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yes. Anyway, that's that's my little little rant. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm you know I I obviously you know I'm aligned with you in terms of the problem, the mission, how we're going to go out. At, you know, but my my engineering mind is is always thinking pragmatically. How do, how do we actually implement this? Right. That's why. When you say, "Yeah, we need ten thousand Bitcoin Jesus," we do. But uh, how are we gonna how are we gonna create that? That's a lot easier said than done, you know. So you got you, me, Roger, Veer, you know, we got the rest of the Bitcoin Cash community, and it's already mostly at its max, right? Everybody is already doing pretty much as much as they can. The obsessed, you know, few such as myself and yourself, right? where do we find that extra horsepower and outreach or what change in strategy? Like you talk about these meetups, like you say, that's not necessarily scalable. If we can't just clone you 10,000 times, what do we spend six months figuring out a program to, like you're saying, to onboard people and then try and onboard 5,000 people to that and then have six months for them to go out and do it. Like what's, I don't know. Well, uh, so, I mean, I, 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 this is unlikely for me. I spoke earlier this year at uh, Liberty Forum of Silicon Valley, and I was surprised that there were even that many Liberty people in Silicon Valley. And I, and I showed up to give my talk, and 350 people showed up, and, and I completely sold out of books. I was stunned. I was not, I was completely not expecting that. So I'm going back there, and I'm doing, um, uh, you know, a, the full workshop to 115 people and we may even have to book a, a second day those people but once this the reason that i went to the trouble of putting together the book and doing the four-hour workshop is once people are educated and once they understand the problem you can't look away from it you can't deny what's actually going on so those 115 people are people that are going to be talking to their friends and family and that are completely outside of the circles that we have been talking to or the echo chamber of what's in, in crypto Twitter, right? Like th these truly are people that are like, that, that are, so um, the, so I view them as the next round of people. I mean, I guess like a truly viral approach and you know, whatever, I can do one of these a week. Again, is that, is that enough? I, no, more people need to do this. And eventually I'm going to make an online version of it because I, I view this as, all of a sudden something happens and I worry it happens like tomorrow. Like when I see the crap that's going on in the news, whether it's an Israel thing or a Russia, Ukraine thing or China, Taiwan or a cyber thing, I'm like, is this going to be it? What is it going to take for them to to kind of push this over? And to me, I'm kind of on on, on eggshells here because it could be at any at any moment in time. But to have an online version to onboard people um, at scale, and then I could see just pumping a bunch of ads, like at the at the time at the moment the emergency hits, blaring out this thing to onboard people, where it's an automated course they can watch the thing, and you know, in this particular instance, it, I guess it would be in some ways like a faucet for BCH, right? So that they, there's no exchange involved or whatever. That, in my mind, that's what I'm prepping for in terms of getting early adopters now and then figuring out a way to use technology to be able to scale to hit millions of people in an emergency. Because this is the, the, the challenge that we have is they're able to manipulate people using these emergencies. Like this is, and there's really no way, right? So we've been doing whatever we can do and um, people aren't gonna pay attention until it's an emergency. There's really no way. It's kind of like in tech. You have um, you have innovators, then you have early adopters, then you have early majority and late majority. There's kind of like that whole like process of how you get something out there. Well, the problem that we have is our competitors have the force of the state. Our competitors have monopoly control over money. Our competitors can engineer tragedies, terrorism, biological weapons attacks and then can control and censor the media to put out their message to push what they're trying to put forward. That's what we're competing against, right? The odds are not in our favor on this. So I, I'm, you know, and I'm speaking out loud and I'm always, you know, again, we need 
as many people doing this as possible. But as, the, as far as I can tell, the best thing that we can do is cultivate early adopters now and then position ourselves to be able to scale to offer an alternative solution when the time comes. I, that's that's as, And even with that, what I'm saying is these odds are long. I wish people... Um, I, again, re, read the book or whatever, but but watch this stuff. You know, the the you will own nothing and be happy. Their their timetable is twenty thirty. I mean, if they're successful at their timetable, we know when they're trying to do what they're trying to do, and we know what they're trying to do. And so that's their plan. What's our alternative? Like even here, and I've tried to express this to people. You know, we're not going to go back to where we were before 2019. And in fact, the U.S., I mean, basically, the, I, this 30-year mortgage, which came under FDR, to me, is like a pyramid scheme. The, the, the dollar is a, is a Ponzi scheme. And we're at like this point in time where, depending on whether it's the mortgage or the dollar or whatever it is, we're four or five levels into the pyramid scheme or Ponzi scheme, right? You don't go back in a Ponzi scheme. It's not like, oh, well, things are bad. Things are blowing up. Let's just go back two levels and restore point to level three in the Ponzi scheme. And then everything's going to be normal. There is no going back to that. So they're pitching 15 minute cities. They're pitching I mean, which this stuff is dystopian to me, but but it isn't necessarily dystopian to everybody else. There are people looking at this stuff saying, oh, this looks great. A 15 minute city. We're going to, you know, we're going to fix the environment and and we're going to the, the 17 that we're going to eliminate poverty. We're going to have clean water. We're going to, you know, all of this like, you know, double speak that they put out there. They're putting out a positive vision like the best that we have is. We're uncovering one day after the next how everything that we've learned has been a lie and that all of these systems that we're dealing with are corrupt. And, and the best that we have is like hopeful thinking that we're going to go back two rungs in a in a Ponzi scheme. So like I, there's an aspect of this, too, where it's like, OK, we can get everybody off of fiat. We can do a parallel economy. But there's also kind of a like revisit or what is our positive message to compete in, in the same way when they try to push CBDCs. We have BCH and a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer economy. How do we combat 15-minute cities and, and all of the other propaganda? So there's a bigger issue even wedded within this. And I think the currency thing just buys us time. But there's fundamental questions that we should have a broader-based discussion about, I think, as, as society. Definitely. I mean, this is reminding me a lot of uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, has his arc whatever it's called the alternative revolution for civilization i don't know what it stands for but he's basically trying to come up with what you're talking about some kind of societal messaging some kind of plan some kind of yeah vision for society that does not involve increasing levels of control and everyone you know, factoring in modern technology and society, like for instance, homeschooling, you know, is a uh, is in some of the videos that I've seen, right? Because they've just realized, well, if people are getting educated in these mass, you know, government schools, this is just never going to work. And especially after coronavirus and all the problems that happened there, a lot of parents realized <laughs> what was going on with that. It wasn't just like, oh, this is the done thing. It was like, holy crap. You know, look at how little they care about my kids. There's got to be an alternative, right? So, well, I think, and I think the struggle with this is we've lost the ability for abstract thought. So, the reality is, if you have uh, freedom and you have peer to peer commerce, then, then the actual future is unlimited. You, what 8 billion people can do through voluntary exchange in various combinations, you, you can't describe it. There isn't a central plan. There isn't a, a concept. And, and it's one of those things where I don't want to know what things are going to be like 10 years from now. I want to be in awe and amazement of what people I don't know came up with or even what what, what I was doing. So, so there's not a, I guess, that, so it's even maybe a, how do we learn how to market the infinite potential of, of voluntary exchange, knowing that we have a society that has been through public education and through indoctrination, they've had the abstract thought actually ex removed from them. Like even the idea in the United States that American home ownership is, is the American dream, like that didn't, the, originally the concept of the American dream was self-actualization. Now, like through this process of making things concrete and everything else, now the idea is 
if you own a, if you have a financial instrument where you pay more in interest than in principal over a 30 year time period of time and have the illusion of owning a house, that's been pinned as being an American dream. And this is a, I, going off on a bit of a tangent, but, but how, how do we express, how do, how do you take something that's abstract and infinite, but present it in a way so that people can see it as an alternative to something like 15 minutes. And obviously I don't have the answer to this, but it's something that I've been thinking about a lot because I, because I see, see time and time again where people, I mean, it's even like voting, right? I mean, you, you know, people are tricked into these manufactured polarity contests. So it's like, oh, oh, Biden versus Trump. That's not a that's not a decision. Like to me, that's like picking out what interior you want for your coffin. There's no real that's not really a choice. But people think that that there are only two choices and that they have to pick one of those. And that's not true, actually, with any aspect of our lives. We actually have, you know, kind of infinite possibilities. But people aren't even aware of that concept of infinite possibilities or what can happen through voluntary exchange. Um, so uh, this is an open-ended comment that I don't have, uh, I don't know what the answer is, but I gave a talk on this at the Brownstone Institute. I, I, I called it kind of like America 2.0 from first principles. Like, so my, my, I guess I, I would argue that America has failed. If you look at what the first principles are versus where we are today, and if you look at what the Constitution said versus how the Constitution is, is being followed today. And there's interesting parallels in looking at this and then actually looking at crypto as well. I kind of like reading Roger's book was is interesting on, from the standpoint of, you know, you can look at like the the white paper, are like the foundational principles. The code is like the Constitution. And then I, the way I, I, I view BTC devs are like activist judges. Right. Like there's it, it, there's actually we haven't solved a, hum, the, a human governance aspect of this. Like I like I like the fact that um, like the Bitcoin model gets rid of the third party in transactions. But we still haven't figured out how how humans should interact with with each other. And, and, and actually, even the case within Bitcoin shows the absolute failure um, from a how the development process worked. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting off tangent, but I spend time, like I, like, I don't know what the answer is, but it'd be nice to figure out how to start having a conversation about these kinds of ideas. Like what went wrong? Like, I think America was a great innovation at the time. So when I say this, it's not to say that America is awful compared to what existed at the time. It was a brilliant invention. And, and when you look at the kinds of debates and discussions and the Federalist Papers and, and, and all of the kind of, of back and forth, um, it was a great process. But that was 250 years ago. Maybe we need a process like that again from, from first principles. I mean, I, you know, I sit back and I think, well, what was the world like 250 years ago? So much of, of what's in, baked into the U.S. Is, is, is really even based on kind of materialism and, and Newtonian physics. Right. I mean, in, in, in many senses. Well, now we have quantum like like those kinds of changes. Is there anything that we learned in 250 years that would cause us to question our core foundational principles as kind of a starting point? So um, I'd like to try to figure out how to get a discussion going on that. And I haven't figured out how to even start getting that conversation going because most people are not interested in this or it's like, what the hell is this guy talking about? But I do think there are parallels here with what's going on politically and even what's going on within these blockchain wars. Yeah, well, it makes me think of the idea. Well, the first thing when you when you were starting on that segment, I was thinking, you know, there's that meme of like what the world would be like if, you know, some trivial thing and then it's the family standing on the hilltop and there's the gleaming space disks and like the futuristic city and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. That was what I thought of. And then I was sort of thinking, okay, well, with Bitcoin Cash, you know, needs some way to break through this narrative. Maybe it is some kind of marketing campaign or realignment of the community's, not values necessarily, but its presentation to an alternative society. Like for a long time, BCH or Bitcoin was always about, you know, an alternative economy maybe it needs to be the alternative future you know bitcoin cash the alternative future or something like that which if we all kind of got on the same page about 
that being the best way to do it. Green is actually a fantastic color for it because you can have some nice <laughs> nature and stuff like that. You know, uh, orange is a bit warning and a bit scary, right? <laughs> green is green is nice. Some, something like that. And then here's an action plan. Download a Bitcoin Cash wallet, transact peer-to-peer with somebody, and then whatever other, you know, following steps, right? That could be... I don't know, like uh, you were saying about Agenda 2030, maybe it needs to be called something 2030, you know, Alternative 2030. You've got Agenda 2030 or Alternative 2030. Here's your Agenda 2030. This is what the rules are going to be. Here's the evidence. You've seen it in your own life. Here's the banking shutdowns. Here's all this stuff. And here's the alternative in green. I don't know, just spitballing. I like that. So I like that kind of idea because I and I had a slide in my presentation where it's like, so here's what a, they're presenting, right? This is what Agenda 2030 is, and their their vision is this like beautiful, 15 minute city. And then there's the reality of what they're actually going to implement, which is you know people living in a pod basically with VR headsets, right? So so there's kind of a this is what they're presenting. This is the reality, and then I put at the bottom. So what do we have? And I took a, a screenshot from this movie coming out next week, Civil War. In America, right? So, 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 what we're, what we're offering right now is just complete decay and breakdown of society. And what what is our what is our alternative? And again, the challenge with this is that because it's freedom, you, you can't predict or centrally plan. But then, expressing the concept of infinity and unlimited is how do you even do that, right? We what we have to offer is unlimited possibility, right? It really truly is everything, whatever anybody can imagine, because it's not even necessarily going to be one thing. Society isn't. But how do you how do you express that? Because that is what 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 you have if you have freedom. But how do you express that to, to, in, in a way to people that have been conditioned to only think in concrete? Um, so like I said, so maybe it's a whole bunch. Maybe it's an animated thing up here. Different types of multiple different options of what things might be like under a voluntary society. But instead of just one, it's like here's. You're 30, right? Um, but to try to captivate people around the idea of infinite possibility, um, I think that fits somewhat with what you're saying is instead of just an alternative to 2030, multiple different alternatives to 2030. Um, this is a big challenge, right? This is because most people are still holding on to pre-2019. Like, oh, things are just going to go back to this. That's not available to anybody, we're going to get a great reset of some sort, one way or the other. Um, it's just what's it going to be? Uh, what they're preparing for and putting billions of dollars to to build, or or something else that we can create? That's interesting. I mean, I obviously, yeah, the world the world has has changed, and I think that's I think a lot of people have felt that. You know, I. I personally felt that. And I think a lot of people have that COVID was sort of the before times. And then there was COVID with the new normal right now that's receded a bit. We are a bit more back to how it was, but it's not totally back to how it was. And it probably, you know, never is going to be like with smartphones or the way society is these days. Right. So, I mean, in terms of giving people the idea of unlimited possibility and the importance of freedom and so forth, yeah, you're right. That's a hard thing to do. I think you would have to find some way to make it more concrete. Uh, like you have to explain it in terms of – like you have in the book about a, a little story. You start with a, a sort of dystopian story about a family and what happens to them. That's, I think, what you need to – you know, you can't just say, okay, we're in this futuristic, you know, space future from freedom. It needs to be more like in 10 years, your kid is not going to be able to do whatever because, um, you know, everything's CBDCs. And from the age they're five years old, they're always they're already being judged on all these digitally documented methods. Some, something like that, I think, is, is probably the way. Yeah, I think so. So I, 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 that's a great idea. And I want to start doing more of that more, you know, Bitcoin Cash is the answer to the made program, uh, you know, for 28 year old women with autism, like and, and, and by the way, it gets worse every day. So what so the book that you have, this was like published in June of last year. And this is one of those things where you read this and yes. you could be like, 
oh my God, this sounds pretty bad. It can't really be that bad. Everything in this book has gotten worse. Every aspect of everything in there has actually deteriorated. Like the MADE program has accelerated. The crackdown on crypto has accelerated. I mean, when I when I first wrote the book, you know, Ian Freeman wasn't even in jail. So I did at least update it, you know, for that. But it's like, yeah, no, people are going to prison. Businesses have been shut down. Uh, euthanasia is increasing in the state. More countries are implementing CBDC. More countries are implementing social credit systems. Every day in the United States, 100,000 surveillance cameras are installed. Our pictures are taken 75, 80 times a day, in addition to whatever pictures that we take of ourselves voluntarily and load onto social media, right? So most people have this concept of China is this big, bad communist country and they have all the surveillance tech. We get half of our AI surveillance technology from China. Um, and Snowden obviously warned us back in 2013 about all of the egregious misuses of, of surveillance by the NSA and, and everybody else. So we're not we're actually not even any different. And every time we get one of these emergencies. So we got contact tracing for this part of COVID. Right. They put, we have wireless you know, tokens tracking our behavior. Did, did they rescind that or is that still right? I, I don't remember seeing the notice that that that's no longer. Oh, we've taken that off your phone. Right. Every time we go through this, it's it's I mean, I, I remember it's every time you sit back and reflect. I remember I used to be able to go to the airport like 20 minutes before a flight and just get on the plane. I remember being a kid and like flying and, you know, I, I would go to visit my my grandmother and I'm like seven and they like put me on the plane and I could actually go and be greeted by, you know, my grandparent at, 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 at the terminal. We forget how much we've already lost just in. 25 years, right? It's actually remarkable to think about. Um, and none of that ever goes away. They never reverse any of it. Even though Americans don't like the Patriot Act now, they haven't rescinded any of the Patriot Act. They've added more to it when these other emergencies come up, like the Bank Secrecy Act, all of the KYC AML stuff, that has gotten to be out of control. When I was running for office, I went to set up a political bank account and it was at a bank where I'd already had an account. And I had to go back three times to prove to them my identity. And they, they're asking me all these questions. We're going through all this stuff for a, for a bank account where I've already had a, a, an existing relationship with the bank. Um, you know, good luck trying to withdraw more than $5,000 out of a bank. They may not have the physical cash. You may have to set up an appointment two to three days in advance. Uh, and and unfortunately, younger generations have actually been conditioned to this to the point where this is one of the struggles that I have. It's like I, I've been surprised at the interest and in uptake with boomers. Right. Because, again, yes. you see all these wars online and I'm not I'm not trying to wade into that. I'm trying to say, listen, the problem is that point zero 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 one percent of people that want to consolidate power and create a one world government, not the intergenerational stuff. That's just another diversion. Not that there aren't some accurate things in some of the memes and, 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 and some of the intergenerational stuff. But then you see things like, you know, Cato Institute puts out a report that 35 percent of Gen Z would be OK with federal surveillance cameras in the home to monitor for domestic violence. Right. So when I see something like that, like there's a the uh, I know we all value privacy, but I, I don't think privacy is necessarily even valued at the generational level by um, by certainly Gen Z. So so even explaining the, like you actually have to go through you're having different conversations with different groups of people and, and, and they're completely different conversations. Like you have to try to convince Gen Z why privacy is important. You have to convince, you know, boomers why banks are this is a coming yeah and it's like it's so 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 it's wild and 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 it's it's tough because none of like the core principles around individual rights or freedom are, are like seem to be that universal anymore it, it, they, and they've been eroded in different ways kind of generationally yeah i mean i'm, I'm kind of getting to i i don't know where to go with all this like we we were going to talk about hijacking Bitcoin. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm always a right. This is the problem with this, right? It's like this is it's it, it but it, it is what. It no, is. it's it's all it's all valid and it's all. You know what I'm struck by is that I'm much more captivated by this, by your sort of your personal energy and your pitch and stuff, 
than the book. Not that the book was bad or anything. It's great. Uh, the final countdown and so forth. But I don't think for getting this vision out to people at scale, you've got, you've got to make some flashy videos or some something like that, you know, some 10 minute talks or whatever on a YouTube channel. It's got to be something like that because I think that's going to hit harder. The book is like, you can take this and read it after for the details if you're interested. Right. But uh, in terms of actually getting someone's attention, and that's, I mean, when you talk about Gen Z, you know, that's the kind of thing. It's just so hard to make a viral clips on Instagram or Twitter or anything like that as well too because the, the algorithm's kind of stacked against you. It's not easy to do no matter who you are, even if you're fucking Jay-Z, right? But uh, then let alone <laughs> if you have a message that is likely to get uh, censored or manipulated against. So what's wild is so I've done all this political activism and I've gotten press in the past during political activism. And, and I thought when I because I announced that I was running for president in February of last year. And so I was one of the first people to announce. And I ran as a Republican specifically because I wanted to get on the debate stage. So my whole purpose on this was, if, hey, hey, if I can get to the debate stage, my message was I'm wearing this shirt now. My the, the thrust of my campaign was bank run now It's basically promoting a bank run. And the shirt says halt CBDC. Stop World War Three and end the Fed with a with big heart around it. This was the, this was like the cornerstone of my message. I've got this bank run manifesto that I had, and I would have thought the press just just from the standpoint of this guy's nuts or you know tinfoil. Like I, I would have thought that it would have gotten a, a, a reaction just based on how extreme it was. And and I've never been as shut down ever on on anything other than in delivering this message, which is probably because of how dangerous it is, because people the ECB has actually put out warnings saying we're monitoring social media to try to prevent bank runs. So, of course, I'm on the ECB and the BIS all of the time putting this message on there, linking to the bank run manifesto. I've been doing this for a long time with the Federal Reserve as, as well. And um, but I don't know what's already flagged and what's already suppressed. I've actually been testing around that. I do think CBDC and bank run are flagged terms. And so it is an interesting, I, so I'm trying to figure out how do you communicate these ideas using slightly different language? Um, because I think it's a powerful, one thing that happened, I, I did a little bit on TikTok. When Kanye West um, was canceled by JP Morgan Chase, I actually reached out to him. So so he did a video and I actually posted the clip of it. He's like, you know, if they're going to if they're going to shut me out of one hundred million dollars, how's your bank account doing? Basically was his message. So I sent him a copy of my book. And I, th this is before he went off and did all of his other stuff. Like I'm trying to figure out because because people get canceled. Nigel Farage got canceled. Dr. Mercola, uh, the Canadian truckers. Obviously, this is already happening without CBDC. We're already seeing people's fiat accounts being shut down. And uh, and that actually helps, too, by the way, with our with our movement. We have interesting overlap. There, so like in terms of communities, there's there's like the brownstone community. There are there are people that are I mean, there's some Trump supporters. That's kind of a weird vibe. But there's a but a lot of people in the uh, health freedom movement, the vaccine, like uh, those those are folks that are aware of overreach but they're not uh, in crypto like there's so, so i it's been an interest so so part of the messaging for me is it's like okay you guys have been warning about this vaccine stuff and you've been warning about this stuff for like literally decades and then it finally happened right i'm now what's next right so this is next so i'm trying to say it's like okay yes you're focused on this issue and we're trying to resolve the tyranny of the past couple of years, but understand they're moving forward. They got new tyranny. You can win a court case on A, B, and C and think that you've won. And the next thing that they're gonna do is drop a hammer on basically completely controlling digitally all access to your money, right? So you, we've got to stay ahead of, of what's going on. So, so even working within these communities and trying to get the right messaging, I think that's a very rich community um, for people to be exposed to to Bitcoin Cash. I, and, and, you know, again, and there are a lot of them. So I had this article to hit on Z, uh, Zero Hedge. So I have hundreds of people from across the country that, that want to do these um, the workshops. And this is the thing that, that this is why I got really um, excited about that, seeing the response, because I just had a website where it's like, okay, 
give me your name and email address and then write a little note. And, and people were like, this is really important. I read this article. I can get 30 people to show up to the event. Like, so people are waking up and I guarantee you all of these are people that are not already in crypto. I mean, by design, based on what the language of this is. So I, I actually think, I, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I think if we start going to where to people that we might not have otherwise addressed, we're going to find completely new advocates, completely new energy and people that can bring in their own their own networks and to explain these concepts in ways that that resonate with their audience. I mean this whole mark of the beast concept is a that is a real that is a real one. Now I will say within that there are some people that view CBDCs and decentralized crypto as being the same thing. That they actually are just they're just kind of anti Right. Uh, which is why I do gold and silver and I, and I do these gold backs. I saw something like yesterday where somebody had like tokenized on BCH a gold, gold back or gold backs. Like that's a really cool idea as well. And I, I don't know what is, I don't know if you know anything about that project or wh what all is behind that. But that would be really interesting to be able to tie digital tokens and physical uh, physical gold uh, that like that's a really powerful idea. Can I hop in here for a moment? Sure. Okay. So I've mentioned before, hold on, let me turn my volume down a bit. I mentioned before uh, how I wanted to do like essentially a 3D printing workshop where people could spend a little BCH, get some kind of token that represents the finished 3D product at the end. Uh, that gets sent to them. And when they physically go to the location, they redeem the token for the item. Um, but listening to this conversation, I think like there should be maybe a guide, a manifesto, like something that's like a holistic approach to decentralization where we have these currencies. We encourage the use of 3D printers. We encourage the use of like local small neighborhood farms. And there are farm bots now that work very similar to 3D printers that can automate planting, watering, all of that kind of stuff, like batteries, solar panels, that kind of thing. But the one concern that I have with all of this is people lose the convenience of modern society. And how, how do you attract people into a situation where they have to put more work in? Yep. And also people are so afraid to go out now in this kind of parallel, alternative, decentralized, voluntary economy requires going out and mixing with your, your neighbors. I don't know how to make that marketable. I, well, I think that's a great that's a great concept. And actually, in New Hampshire, this, of course, this is one of the beauties of the Free State Project is that that happens here. We have farms. We have free staters that, that run farms. We have free staters that I, I mean, you, you can get whatever you want in, in New Hampshire. And that's but but when I go to California, that doesn't really help. Um, I, I think part of part of the issue is and this like so it's why I wrote the first chapter of the book is to letting people know what the alternative is, because people are trying to protect what they think they have without understanding that what they actually have is completely under attack and that the other thing is much worse. So because you're right. And by the way, that is the big issue. That's 100 percent the issue, like on convenience. This is why I get so frustrated about BTC, because when I first used BTC, it was better it was a better technical form of money. And now it's not. Uh, certainly BTC is not and Lightning is not. So to the extent that we can make things decentralized and convenient, obviously that's that's the win and anything that we can do to enhance that. But I'm seeing more and more people. And again, I, I guess to me, I, I, it's like this, this, I don't know what describes the, it, there are a lot of boomers and a lot of people that were just blindsided by COVID. They are open to this, they're open, but, the reason that I, I'm doing the work, and I think like the idea of what you said about a workshop or whatever, like the, it needs to, there needs to be the in-person aspect of it. There needs to be the interactivity because to take that leap into decentralization, like I wrote this book to be self-contained, right? If you read this book in the end of it, it tells you how to download a wallet. It tells you how to sign up for BitPay. It tells you how to buy gift cards. It tells you how to pay your bills, even potentially like, and, and I bet if 1% of the people that have bought this book have done this, I would be shocked. Right. It's meant to be self-contained, but I know they're not going to do it. And people said, but I really want to know how to do this. And so the question is, how do we teach people decentralization? There's the appetite for it. But then how do you deliver an in-person message about decentralization that actually scales, given that there is the 
human time, you know, interactivity component to it. I, I don't have an answer to that, but I like, I love the idea of getting all of these decentralized ideas together at, as a resource to start going beyond. Because even this, it's like, I'm like, all right, guys, if we don't stop the currency, then all of the other stuff is dead. But it's not really a positive vision, right? Like my, my vision is we've got a doomsday scenario. Here's a way to buy some time, but it's not like, you know, there's no utopian aspect of this. There's just a buy time uh, before fraud <laughs> aspect. Before we all get crushed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, you know, all this is making me think of, I've been really interested in, uh, Charlie from Resist CBDC, shout out to him. You know, he and I had some argument on Twitter, I don't know, a year or two ago, right? And he was like promoting this Resist CBDC and all that. So I tried talking to him about Bitcoin Cash and he was like, no, no, no Bitcoin's shit. Like the government's just going to switch off the electricity or whatever. And I was like, look, that's not kind of really the case. And anyway, we had a bit of back and forth. And then eventually I got him on the show and we talked about it. And I think it clicked for him, you know, a bit more in that sense. We were able to like to come to an understanding there. And then since that, I've seen it's like the old, like his Twitter account has like changed. Like he will repost my stuff. He likes it, you know, the comments that are like, look, the BDC guys are captured and BCH is like, we're trying to fucking break through here and all that. You know, this is somebody who's gone from like one end of like, I don't know or get crypto to like the complete other end of like, I understand all the block size wars and all the scams and the, he like did an end run around the entire like, 10 years worth of, you know, kids and NFT speculators and getting lost in the way and all that. It's incredible. And I'm, you know, that's like, that's what I'm hearing when you're talking about you're, you're hitting on that same vibe, that same group of people. And maybe we just need a more efficient or effective. And because you think, I think of the things he does as well too. Like he goes out to shops and he hands out cards to them explaining, you know, cash is being eliminated and blah, 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 blah. And he's doing this. He's targeting that same thing. I think there's something here. Maybe you and I and him need to all jump on a call and, you know, figure out a planet because I think that's the right <clears throat> idea right it needs to be something like that but instead it needs to be a one page piece of paper like you said the book you know that's like the follow-up stuff you need the one piece of paper that is like here download celine wallet call up this number and if you're a real fucking person we'll send you five dollars of bch and then send it to the four other people in your house see how it works and then some of that vision stuff maybe I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. <laughs> but, no, I think that's, that's a great idea. And when I'm out in California, I'm hoping to get together with him, actually. So, because, um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, obviously we're all aligned and we need we need everybody to 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 jump in on this. And, and again, it's not I, I'm not if I'm coming off as defensive, I, I, I'm not I'm not like I, I to me, it's just a I'm glad that the trial went the way that it did. And I'm glad that Roger's book came out because that changed everything. So I was, I was nervous about BSV and I was actually nervous about if, if Craig managed to win actually the lawsuit, the implications of that, that was actually because I've been involved. I was, I was a co-defendant in 200 and $80 million for the lawsuits for like five and a half years. I've been in a situation like this and it's weird. Like, uh, a, you can sue somebody for conspiracy to do something. And even if they had just a minuscule involvement in it, they can have the same financial liability as the person that basically did all of the bad acting. And so I, I was looking at that lawsuit and I'm like, God, you know, the, the, what a chilling effect on developers, what a chilling effect on the space. And that that being alleviated, I think, is, is a it's a bigger thing than people, I think, talk about. Or, or express, or maybe even understand, because you, you have to live through this horrible legal system. To it, it, the fact that it took me five and a half years. Good luck starting a business when you're being sued for two hundred eighty million dollars. And and you know, so when Craig went on and said, "I'm going to destroy this person, and I'm going to destroy their families, and I'm going to do this," like yeah, lawfare actually does that 
to people. So, um, so I think like we're in a completely like just in four weeks time, the, like there's like the world has changed in a sense because because we have now the block size increasing. We have Roger putting out this book, which we haven't talked about yet, which I think I, I do hope everybody reads because it's it, it is it is clearly making a splash based on the reaction from the people that are implicated in this book. Um, and and then the the Craig Wright thing going away. I think this actually gives us the ability to galvanize around a solution and hopefully bring in. I, this is why I mentioned the thing with big blocks. Like, I, I hope we can get some of the other big block people to recognize that we have a shortage of time and this is the best shot that we have. This is just from the ecosystem and from everything else and from the fact that from the very beginning, this has been about, Bitcoin Cash has been about peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. That's never wavered. There's never a moment in time where this community wasn't about that. So I, 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 hope, I hope we can bring yeah. up <clears throat> Yeah, this is good. I like this. All right. Okay, here's the path forward. So let's let's have a quick chat about hijacking Bitcoin then. So I have a copy in the mail, which I haven't received, but I also downloaded the Kindle version so I could have a bit of a read of it. I've read about the first 20% and it honestly just, you know, nothing in it so far has really caught me off guard. He's just sort of starts by walking through the basics of, how Bitcoin works and why the, you know, the mission was peer to peer cash. And then it was kind of changed to me. Zero of it is a surprise, but I'm very glad because this is the kind of thing that even though I know and the whole Bitcoin cash community knows most of the world does not know like any of this uh, stuff and just laying it out piece by piece where you can read it all without a thousand trolls in the comments screaming this guy's a bad person or or whatever now he put out this book and almost immediately like the next day there was an article written by blockworks who are one of these crypto news outlets they put out an article which said on the title roger veer was right about bitcoin Hijacking Bitcoin is a damning indictment of the turmoil and nastiness that plagued the Bitcoin community after Satoshi disappeared. And I have a small quote here. I couldn't have been more wrong. In fact, after finishing hijacking Bitcoin, my opinion now stands that Bitcoin truly was hijacked and Ver really was the subject of what has now been an almost decade long smear campaign. End quote. So that's this segment from this uh, lady, Molly something uh, um if somebody can <laughs> it's too small for me to read on my screen anyway she had basically been in crypto and covering crypto news and all that for years <clears throat> and she had heard roger veer sucks and b cash is a scam or whatever and just believed all of it and then read this book and somehow this just you know gave her the road to damascus moment where she was like wait just this book completely flipped her opinion that she thought he was going to write this big conspiracy about everyone hates me and spicy anecdotes. Instead, he just went through the facts with the quotation marks and all the stuff that is just common knowledge in the Bitcoin cash community, but condensed into this book and with his reach and notoriety specifically on this topic, it has also just generated so much of an earthquake from people being like, wait, I never understood any of this. And at the same time, there's been all the pushback from all the laser eyes who had all this, oh, it's Roger scamming again, blah, blah, blah. But they don't have literally any substantive points. Like I haven't seen a single person reviewing any of it and saying this is wrong or this is incorrect. It's all just ad hominem attacks. And I think for the people who reading this and are waking up a bit and they can see it happening in real time that he said, look, this is how the narrative has changed. And then you see an example of it. So tell me about this book. Obviously you were quite impressed and you've got your own engagement <laughs> on it as well too. I, I, I did. Well, I, I was familiar with a lot of the story and have been following it, you know, but, but, but wasn't familiar with some of the details. And the second part of the book is where he really goes into the hijacking aspect. The first part is really kind of why the original Bitcoin white paper and idea was was a great vision. I, I think one thing that struck me about the book is that it's not like Roger telling so much his story with it, where it's like, here's my opinion on this. Most of the book is 
actual quotes from like BTC core devs. So, so most of the, so it's packed with information and it's actually more, it's more told from the words of the people that were actually doing the bad dude deeds, which is, which is, which is the fascinating part about this. And like, to your point, w people that engage online, like Adam back blocked me, Luke Jr. got in there. And like, so everybody immediately jumped in people that are referenced in the book, people that are quoted in the book. And like I keep, they, they, they'll bring up a point. I'm like, oh, hey, have you read the book? What is your specific complaint? It's like, oh, he's a scammer. He's this, he's this. It's like, it's, they're your own words. Are you going to refute your own words? It's incredibly fact-based and no one wants to engage on a single fact. To me, I think more getting a visceral understanding, and I still don't know some of the specifics, like, like the Bitcoin Foundation fell apart at some point. And then this MIT Multimedia Lab picked up the slack of funding devs. Now, to me, I wrote an article about this as well that I mentioned earlier about the Epstein connection, which which Roger doesn't have that in there. But yes. I, I think that it is obvious that it was hijacked, but I think that there we need to go even a next set of levels here to really understand and expose who and why. So for instance, I mean, there's this guy, John Dillon, who was, was funding some of the development work, who, who at some point, uh, even claimed he was in the intelligence community and he was pushing the digital gold versus digital cash uh, narrative and was funding some of the development work. You have um, obviously what the MIT multimedia and then you have the whole block stream side of this and their primary initial funding, I think, from AXA, where the, the guy that was the CEO of AXA was was literally the chairman of the Bilderberg group. Yeah, so I don't know if you know this, but uh, you were mentioning it before and it uh, slipped my mind, but now it's coming back. So there's a documentary, Who Killed Bitcoin? Have you seen that? I believe, is that Naomi Brockwell? No. Uh, well, it was by the guys, Luca, in the guys in Argentina, and okay. they made a documentary that goes into all this when you were talking about Joy Ito and the Epstein stuff. Oh, and that's all that. in there and the funding okay. of Blockstream and, and whatever. Anyway, they made this incredible documentary, which was originally in Spanish. And then I did the voiceover for the English version, which is on YouTube, and it's been played at Pork Fest and all that. And I think for you, that's maybe going to be the missing piece because I think that ties together the stuff you were talking about with the parts in hijacking Bitcoin. Who killed Bitcoin is basically the middle segment of that. And when I think when you, so for anybody who's listening, obviously I highly recommend you go and watch this documentary and also check out the hijacking Bitcoin book. But in terms of the actual connections and how, who are all this shady characters and so forth involved. Yeah, that's a whole separate kind of kettle of fish to get the idea to people besides also, you know, Bitcoin. and I think Roger was sort of left that out. Uh, if I haven't, again, I haven't read the rest of it myself, but I imagine he didn't go heavy on that to get exactly the reaction that he got, like from this Blockworks uh, reviewer who said like I was expecting all these conspiracy theories and all this stuff and instead what she got was like a load of facts and a very clear basic explanation of how things were and then how they ended up you know fucked up and that he had been slandered throughout this whole thing but I think because he's not making too much of a personal defense of himself yep. then it comes across as just this is this is actually just the facts right yeah, and it definitely, and so it's damning. The book is very damning if you read it, and it's very factually based. But I also think we need to dig into some of these other components because it certainly does seem like we need to find out the motivation for this. Because I, even when you see the the arguments and what people uh, are, are saying, and I don't even know if it, it, one of these guys is actually Greg Maxwell that's on here quoting under. But there's this whole idea that that Bitcoin is successful because of ETFs, like the idea that you are. You're buying something from a WEF partner company and then storing it in a third party exchange is about as far away from peer to peer digital cash as you can get. Like even the idea that that's a selling point is so divergent. And then people are claiming that this is going to be the backing for a global reserve currency. None of this makes any sense. Um, I, and I think what Blockstream has done. I think even there should be more critical analysis of, of Blockstream and what even what they're doing with with liquid. Um, there, I mean, this book could have been, you know, five times as long as it is. But I, I do think that it lays out the case for people that are unfamiliar with it. Um, 
in no uncertain and very clear terms that Bitcoin was hijacked. You can't walk away thinking anything other than that. And then it only gets worse from here. And hopefully this will stimulate people to start looking into the other aspects of this, because this might be, by the way, the reason why I think looking into some of the conspiratorial aspects is important is because that might be a way to get people out of Bitcoin, out of BTC, right? Because people are in, people are in it. I mean, it's based on the white paper, right? They're still selling the white paper and the thing has nothing to do with the white paper. So on the one hand, they're selling a document that talks about peer-to-peer cash and what they're actually giving people is something that can be easily confiscated and, and that is completely centralized and in the control of a handful of devs, right? And the general public, that's not what their mindset is around this. And so I think that that digging into this and actually investigating this further is is going to be helpful to um, kind of separating out very clearly what BTC is versus what Bitcoin was supposed to be and what BCH is. <clears throat> yes, yes. And I mean, obviously, there's a drum that the BCH community have been banging for a long time, but this truly might be sort of a watershed moment i think maybe if we look back in you know two years or five years or hopefully when the when the history books of the history books are, are written you know this might be the, I, honestly i was very like i said on the show on the last episode i was very bullish on this book and the episode before coming out and making an impact and i think it's gone about as well as could have been expected like you said there's just been an immense amount of like panic and salt and whatever on, on the BTC side. And I take that as very indicative. Why? Because <laughs> there's, you know, for the last few years, there's just been dismissing a uh, BCH or uh, Roger uh, shitcoin scams or whatever. But now the, the fear has started, like we're losing control of the narrative. Right. And there's enough people, enough time has gone by in crypto and we're in this uh, bull run, you know, uh, but BCH, I mean, BTC has not, it's got to all time highs, but only barely. There is no global euphoria. There is no retail adoption coming to rescue and send the price to all time highs to get the media worked up. It just doesn't exist. It was just institutions are coming and now some coins are flowing into ETFs and it's not even really, you know, we should be seeing 100 grand, 150 grand, 200 grand. If that was happening, it would be a different moment. But not only do you, you've got the price all time high breaks, but kind of isn't really, you know, there's no cult euphoria going on. And then this book has come in to just actually like, this is the truth is what we've been trying to fucking tell you this whole time. You kind of can't ignore it. Uh, I no, think. You, no, you can't ignore it. And there was some stuff in there that I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't really track Bitcoin XT that much. So some of this was actually new to me just because I hadn't followed all of the details of it at that, at that point in time. So I kind of like bounced, I was using it, but I wasn't like fully, you know, through, through that period of time. And then more to 2017, I, I, paid a lot more attention to what was going on kind of post 2017. But I, I didn't realize to the extent that there were denial of service attacks. I didn't realize what was going on in terms of threats to miners. Like there was a, there's an aspect to that that was actually new information to me about exactly how much pressure was put on on miners and, and exactly the the extent the to devs which, and all that. yeah um, um you know potentially criminal activity i mean this wasn't this isn't even just a matter of of propaganda some of this stuff is is, is crosses a different a different line and so that was eye-opening to see to see some of that so but yeah no I, I think the book is is again it's it's infinitely credible so i keep on asking when, when somebody debates me it's like oh have you read the book or take the quotes out of the book it's it, even something like this whole narrative of oh bch is isn't decentralized and and the whole idea just this manufactured concept around block size and you know he's got he's got charts in there it's like well here's the here's the price of hard drive space over time here's the the the, the, the cost of bandwidth over time like there's no argument the fact that they're still clinging on like it is such a scarcity mindset that actually doesn't even fit with the facts of reality of what's already happened, what we know has happened since 2009. And they are using the same argument. I, and I think the argument that I get the most, it's, it's either have fun staying poor 
or it's laser eyes, or it's the market has spoken. I think that that's the one that they use the most. The market has spoken. Well, I mean, the market had spoken about Enron and WorldCom. And I actually put out a post with a bunch of stock charts where where the market doesn't speak. The market is an ongoing conversation. The market never the never the market never gives at one point in time. This is the end of the discussion for all time. That's never how the market speaks. But in this particular circumstance, that argument that they're trying to make, you know, I, I like to say it's like, OK, you're you're excited because your alternative asset has half the market cap of Apple and not even twice the size of the economic value of frequent flyer points like like that's not. You, what, so what have you won? Nobody's using it for retail. You lost to Venmo. You lost to Zelle. You lost to Google Pay. You lost to Apple Pay. But you're holding on to half the market cap of Apple and people buying it through WEF partner company BlackRock and storing it at Coinbase. That's what you're holding on to. So, so from my perspective, I think Roger just hammers away the reality of what happened. But I, I'd like to see at least a lot of my posts are going to be about about like this isn't about Bitcoin versus Bitcoin cash. This is about this is about Klaus Schwab. This is about pods. This is about all of this other stuff. This is about this is freedom versus tyranny at, at a very fundamental level. That, 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 I think if we can start shifting the message about that and BTC doesn't have anything to say about that message. People aren't even trying to like, it's weird. I was going back and looking at everybody knows HODL and people used to have Bildel, whatever. That was that was something. Yes. When was the last time anybody saw that? Right. Like no one's building anything in Bitcoin. They've had OK, you've got a trillion dollar market cap. How many conferences do they have where no, people go Nobody and meet says anything? <laughs> Nobody built anything, right. Like it, so your whole value proposition is I bought something and I'm not doing anything with it. And now we're going to have a citadel like, like their vision is like this is somehow this. They're going to exist and all these BTC are going to exist in a citadel somehow outside of whatever else is going on, because because everybody knows the existing financial system wants to completely switch who controls it and base it on who happened to get access to a cryptocurrency bulletin board and mine something 15 years ago, because that 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 that's where everybody's going. I mean, it's just it's it's absurd, but but they're committed to their talking points. So I'm going to do a lot like to try to like back up, particularly this whole the market has spoken idea. I like I like. Well, I mean, you know, and that's the thing that the BCH community has been you know battling with it for a long time. And the typical with all these things, it's about finding the right uh, response. Like the idea is stupid, but you need an idea that is more incisive and cutting a better meme than the one. So for instance, with the, we've been forever, we've been dealing with these fucking graphs of the price charts going down. And I finally got the one that defeats that. And it's the crying face NPC guy with the graph going down and he's saying, look, look. And then you have the yes, Chad and says, bro, I bought BCH at $97. Boom. I've posted that to a couple of people on the price. That's it. You're fucking destroyed right there. Oh, look, look, look at my graph. Like, it doesn't matter, man. I didn't buy at that peak. Like I, you can explain that logically, but having it in a meme form like that, just like that's it, shut down, end of discussion. And when you said about the the market has spoken, yeah, it's like you can say, yeah, well, had the market spoken about Facebook or about MySpace or about Nokia phones? I like your the way you flipped it around. The market has spoken Venmo one. I love that because in people's mental timeline of things, Venmo is actually later than Bitcoin. So it's rather than going, yeah, in the past, things were the past, but now the future, you know, have changed. I love that you're talking about something that's already here. So I, I, I like, maybe we can make some kind of meme of that. Just a laser eye guy saying the market has spoken. And then below it, just like Venmo one or something like that would be, would be excellent like the bitcoin community like they had that uh, conference they had cash up sponsored the btc miami 2021 or whatever that needs to be the background for that meme the market has spoken cash app one or something like that custodians one 
I, 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 I think that we can play off that. The other one that I, I like playing around with is this idea of because people say, well, we already fought this from 2015 to 2017. Roger lost. And so to me, again, the, the instant reaction I got to that was the science. Why are you still talking battle. about him? <laughs> the science yes, battle. that was a great one. Yes. Right? They, like, like, like they're acting like uh, the, the COVID ty tyrants with a lot of their messaging. Or, or I said, you know, instead of 15 days to stop the spread, 15 days to clear the mempool. Like there's just, yes. I, like, I think that there's a whole like, there's a COVID arc to this as well. There behavior though it, 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 i think the thing that that bothers me about it is that they're actually smug and they think that they've won right and, and again and in the broader context it's not about like beating up other people within crypto it's like wow we actually like the bank of international settlements guy is actually outperforming us it's like what the hell's going on here how did we how did we let that happen and, and they're not open to this idea i think adam Back actually blocked me not because of my post with the review. It was the previous post that I had, where he he said something about you know Roger and I, I, my comment was you lost to fiat now you're losing to CBDC and it was but it was very biting in, in language and he, there's no I've gotten zero response from anybody out of BTC that has addressed the adoption of fiat digital payments versus BTC, and no one addresses CBDC, although I'll have some people that will say, I almost in this like weird Craig Wright thing where it's like, well, you know, uh, BTC is going to be the settlement layer for CBDC. BTC is going to be what central banks, how did we get to the idea that you're cheering to be the settlement layer for central banks? Like, like, and there are some people that are even questioning one, one guy who's kind of like, boy, I, I hope I don't end up, you know, being really rich, but it, it, in the end being on the wrong side of this. And it's like, yeah, I mean, you got to you got to look at this. Is, is your goal to maximize? Do you look at central banks with envy and want to become them? Or do you look at central banks and say, this is something that we need to disintermediate and liberate and create a world where people have peer to peer commerce without central banks? There's a completely different mindset. And a lot of the mindset that I'm seeing with BTC is more of I want to be Larry Fink. I want to be a central bank, not I want to replace it and, and liberate, liberate things for the world. So um, I, so, again, I, I'll I'll. I'm sure a lot of the stuff will, will fall flat, but I think if we can start doing some messaging around the bigger picture of who the bigger threat is and, and what, what Bitcoin Cash offers as a, uh, as a solution to complete digital tyranny, I, I think, you know, I, I hope those messages resonate more. They might not, but I, I, I'm going to try it because it's true and it's urgent. So... No, you, you are you are good at this. I I like the science is settled. That's perfect. You can get a picture of Anthony Anthony Fauci with a mask on or something. The science is settled. Small blocks won. Boom. Yep. That's it. That's it. Game over for any. We've already been through this. Blah 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 blah. That's it right there. I've got a uh, quote here. Somebody just uh, tagged me on Twitter with this article from Bitcoin Magazine uh, where they recently had. So I'm just going to read. They did an interview with this guy, Yusuf. Um, I think it's that same guy who's doing Ray Civ Kid on Twitter or whatever. I'm a little bit out of the loop on this. But anyway, here's the quote from this article uh, in Bitcoin Magazine. Yusuf, I mean, yeah, I was pissing all over Roger with all the other clowns before too, but the dude is right. We have lost the ethos. We have lost the foundational base for what we're doing. And should they actually manage to keep Bitcoin out of the picture as this medium of exchange and just keep it as a store of value, eventually we'll lose everything. If it wasn't for what's happening in the global south, it's empty. And quite frankly, the global south has mostly has moved over mostly to USD on USDT on Tron, end quote. So yeah, like that. I get like you said about the last four weeks or five weeks, a lot has changed. Finally, people like real like it's taken this much capture by the existing financial system before people are starting to wake up. Like, were we the bad guys? What have we been pushing this entire time? It's not working, and like you're saying, CBDCs and and fiat are are winning because so many people didn't know the momentum. I think that's another good thing about this hijacking Bitcoin is that at the start, he's already talking about steam was accepting it. 
And you think now if Steam was accepting Bitcoin today, everybody would be fucking to the moon. Like, look at this. We're taking over the entire world. That was nearly 10 years ago. And it's, it's, and it's, it stopped 10 years ago. It didn't start. It had already started. There was that much momentum that that was going on. What today would still be seen as a huge win. You know? yeah, well, so, no, I, I think I would do one of those, you know, PTSD memes because I because I remember that. I remember Q4 of you, Expedia, Microsoft, Fiverr, uh, Steam, Overstock.com. Like, like imagine imagine being able to actually check out using using Bitcoin directly in an e-commerce environment. And, and like they they blew that. And it's just and then celebrate celebrated fifty dollar transaction fees. It's baffling. It's like it's it's really mind boggling how what what happened there. And I am going to watch that documentary because I that actually is a, that is a fascinating part to me. The 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 Epstein thing was because again right in around the, the narrative shifted right around the same time CBDC started to be funded. I I don't find that to be an accident. And um, <clears throat> you know, I tell you one thing that I missed. Did you ever use Coin Text? Uh, <laughs> I didn't, but Jet's nodding his head. <laughs> I thought that was a great idea. Like, I, I don't know, maybe I, maybe people don't. But I, when when uh, the COVID lockdown started, um, I did a bunch of videos, and I immediately got shadow banned. But I was like doing a whole bunch of videos on, okay, they're going to try to shut down communications. So here's this decentralized tech use. Jitsi instead of Zoom, use Signal instead of, you know, whatever. I it's like a series of these like short, short videos. But then I gave a bunch of people crypto using Cointext because that was a really easy way to onboard people. Um, it's too bad it, it doesn't doesn't exist anymore, but whatever. It is, it is what it is. It got mentioned on one of the recent uh, GP spaces. They were talking about it just because they were saying like it was a cool idea and they used it, but the some of the business like case didn't really check out and that kind of ended up being part of its undoing as much as anything else. But uh, anyway, I can see in my mind this uh, one sheet of paper, like you're saying, you're already, I, well, we'll see, but I know you're out there doing the meetups and stuff, meeting people. If you're already connecting with people, we just need to supercharge that a little bit with a one sheet of paper with the logo, download Celine Wallet, read this book, Hijacking Bitcoin, watch this documentary, Who Killed Bitcoin. Boom. I like I can see I can see something something to that. That that could actually be be pretty powerful. It just we just need to fuse a few of these elements together in some kind of punchy uh, package to to break through. Well, one one thing I like is the idea of like if you go, going to a restaurant and like I so I have a business card with a QR code, but giving people a tip using a gold back, and if that gold back, yes, if that gold back was also tokenized, so it's like all right, here's because most people don't aren't aware of gold backs, but it's like oh, it's they're beautiful. And once you see it, yeah, then you're going to really be nice. like, oh, what is all this about? Then I scan the QR code and then the QR code takes them to this page that has all of this information. And then perhaps it's tokenized as well as a way to kind of uh, ratchet that. I agree. We should we should talk and, and figure out a way to get a one pager or a QR code or get get some more viral kind of messaging. I'd love to talk to Roger about, too. Like, I mean, his his. He he was the best at this, right? I mean, I I know at Porkfest, I he he gave away he gave away Bitcoin at Porkfest, and so he he knows how to do this at scale. So I'd like to pick his brain about that as well. All right, well that's that'll have to be for another uh, another stream. We've got just one more thing that I really wanted to uh, get in there today, which was about the Reddit censorship falling apart, because I think that also plays into it. So we had this episode recently, I don't know, you may or may not have uh, seen it, but there was this whole incident with RBTC and the whole censorship kind of cracked down. Well, the mod there, Al Thornton 2462, this uh, character appearing out of nowhere, deleted his reddit account uh quietly in the aftermath of all of that so congratulations to the bch community for winning a victory against the uh psyop there and at the same time we also had ujw in term who is actually the head mod moderator of our cryptocurrency come into our bdc because he had been called out for moderating of you know bch related threads in our cryptocurrencies five million subscribers and for the longest time 
you know, any positive BCH stuff immediately gets deleted or removed or locked. And it happened again with this top voted thread. He got called out and came in and basically said, I dislike Roger Veer. And so that's why there's all this moderation. And anyway, he got wrecked a bunch there, but had to come and talk in RBDC. And Adam Back as well, too, also made a post in RBDC, essentially trying to gaslight us. I can read it out, but who really cares? Anyway, basically, he was saying, like, why don't you just uh, sell your BCH and join BDC? This whole gaslighting, like, I've, I've, that was also a bit of a watershed moment, I think, that the the narrative has has changed because that was an unambiguous win the bch community fought back and was refused to be censored and cut out of the narrative like there had been in the block size ward we'd seen it all before and this time it was just an unambiguous win for the bch community so i guess if i'm going to put a you know a positive spin on all what we've talked about I think there's a there's a kernel of victory in there somewhere between the, the COPA stuff, the turnaround with hijacking Bitcoin, ABLA coming out uh, next month, like you said, to ensure it's scalable and winning against censorship. You know, the BCH community is very resistant to these kind of psyops and takeovers at this point. Maybe Maybe there's something to that. I don't know if you followed this whole uh, Reddit thing, but uh, that that's another rabbit hole you can go down. You can watch the episode on that and then <laughs> see for yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, I've, I've seen stuff on Twitter, but I, I don't know the full details. So I, I'll wait into that one next. I'll you put, got I'll, a lot I'll, of homework. You got a lot of homework after this, uh, <laughs> after this episode. All right, okay, let's just do uh, meme of the week and then we'll kind of uh, get to get to wrapping it up a little bit. Uh, the meme of the week this week comes from Luke Pryor, who is, of course, uh, regular on this show every year for the meme competition. He's the master of the memes. Uh, we're cooking up something for that for this week. Uh, we'll bring that out after Bliss. But he posted on Twitter, just got a text from Jihan. He says the BCH revenge pump isn't going to stop. What does he mean? And then Jihan Wu himself wrote back and said, no, it was not from me. You are scammed. And this was just so good because Luke was just making a joke. Like he says, Jihan did this or Jihan says that all the time because he just uses it as like a stand in for, uh, you know, the big money or, or whatever. But I just thought it was so funny. Not only did Jihan write back to him on April the 1st, which I imagine <laughs> Jihan was also not aware of, but he didn't realize that it was a joke. And he responded in his uh, sort of semi-broken English as well. <laughs> he never writes on Twitter too as well. He has like a thousand posts over his whole Twitter account. But this one was important. Luke got on his radar and he wrote back, you are scammed. So Luke, just a heads up, the text you got from Jihan, the fictional text, that, that was not legit. Anyway, this made me laugh. All right, we got a message to the community you can kind of wrap up with what do you think the Bitcoin cash community needs to hear from all this that we've, that we've discussed. I, I think the, 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 the summary I would say is that the CBDC threat is, is real and it's an existential threat actually to all of crypto. It, it, so this is, this is actually about CBDCs and digital assets all being, uh, centrally controlled and and put into registries and that that technology is is farther along than anyone thinks in terms of, of pilots and 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 political support kind of behind the scenes so I, I think we need to understand the urgency of that situation and that um as you just said i actually think bch has incredible momentum uh because the lawsuit being lifted roger uh entering back onto the scene, uh, this book, I think, is going to change, as Roger said, a lot of hearts and minds with facts, and then the upcoming increase in block size. So this is why, from my perspective, I, you know, I've gone from um, using Bitcoin Cash and it being part of uh, a, a list of, of different alternatives to fight CBDCs. It's now my primary, and I think that it makes sense to put a lot of effort towards onboarding as many people to Bitcoin Cash, because I think the market cap matters. 
the ecosystem matters. Uh, Bitcoin Cash is available on more exchanges. There are already more apps. There's more kind of a retail ecosystem. And so I, I, I believe, based on the urgency of the situation, Bitcoin Cash is the best shot that we have to, to stopping CBDCs, but that it's important that we build on the momentum of uh, what's going on kind of in the marketplace and to maybe switch the messaging to being about how Bitcoin Cash is the alternative to tyranny. It's the alternative to living in a pod. It's the alternative to eating bugs. It's the alternative to carbon credit systems because that really is what it is about. Um, and so much of the narrative is focused on the inside baseball of crypto, but this is really important. This is about this is about free will versus tyranny. And I think that BCH is, is and has been on the right side of this issue. So we need to do everything we can to pump it as, as much as we can in all ways, including adoption and use. So I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> yes. Yes, yes. There's got to be, uh, again, we'll come up with, we'll brainstorm, we'll come up with some kind of catchy slogan, but it needs to be like Bitcoin Cash, the only alternative, or Bitcoin, the only cash, or something like that. Um, needs, yeah, some kind of one, one liner for it. Okay, we've got our supporter appreciation our donators, thank you very much for keeping the show running. Thank you to our patrons, Ricky and HP. Thank you to our sponsor, General Protocols. Check out bchbull.com and the Flipstarter contributors, Majumalu, Marcelo, Marcelo, Shadow of Harbinger, Molecular, B2C, Fork, Adam Back, Lel, Big V, Cheapy, Cheap Lightning, Emergent Reasons, Imaginary Username, Yeah, Beer, and Brian Kanashi. If you need to learn more about Bitcoin Cash and all that we've talked about, you can check out Bitcoin Cash Podcast. Com. If you're new to the show, listen to episode 85, which talks about the whole vision and what's going on. Actually, would be quite a good follow up to this episode. And you can get involved directly at Celine.cash and download the wallet and start transacting with that. All right. Final shout outs then. And where can people find more of you, Aaron? Um, you can go to day2024.com and that has a link to my book and the workshops and, and our articles that I'm writing for Brownstone Institute. And then I'm mostly on Twitter at Aaron R. Day. And that's where I spend a significant portion of my time. All right. My shout out is to the BCH Argentina guys, La Economia, P2P and all that um, that uh, made that Who Killed Bitcoin documentary as well luca and all that because uh yeah that's just uh fantastic and i'm i'll send you a link aaron and i'm sure you'll watch that in the next couple of days and yep. you'll be like wait this is <laughs> this is the real stuff it literally is all those things you are referencing it's all in there it's all in there so for anybody who hasn't seen that that's an also an excellent thing to listen to episode 85 of the show and the who killed bitcoin documentary it's on YouTube. It's in English with me narrating it. And it's also in Spanish if you prefer to hablar en español. So you can look into that. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Until next time. Thank you. Bye.
transactions are